My name is Vernon Heath. I'm the small farm, one of the small farm agents at uh, Virginia State University. The counties that I cover are the counties that surround Richmond. I also do the small farm orientation program. And this is a program that we use to um, get new farmers started. It's a three hour class if we have any new people that think you would be interested in that, you can contact me. Uh, the information is uh, was in the email that you got uh, concerning this uh, Zoom program. So you can just contact me and uh, we'll be glad to work with you. One thing that is very important in farming, doesn't matter whether you have a large farming operation or small, taxes. We often spend most of our time in uh, production. But one thing we have to remember, farming is a business. And with a business, uh, you, the, the most important thing always is the management. One thing that we need to do with when we are producers in agriculture is the management of the business. And a very important component of the management of the business is the farm taxes. And each year, we try to have at least three or four programs throughout the state of Virginia that deal with farm taxes. And over the past, I guess, five or six years, we've always had uh, Mr. Tennant's group to come in and present us programs on uh, farm taxes right before it's time to begin uh, filing your taxes for the year. So we're very happy to have Mr. Darrell Tenney with us today. He can introduce himself and his group and tell what he does and take it from here. And when you decide, you can uh, have breaks if need to be. And you also can tell them how long you'll be speaking today. So I turn it over to, to Darrell. Um, what he has to say, is of more value to you than what I would say. So I turn it over to you, to you, Daryl, and thank you so much this morning for being here with us. All right, Daryl, thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet everyone, okay? Um, my name is Daryl Tenney. Uh, I am with the Tenney Group, okay? We are a, a tax accounting firm, and one of our specialties is agri agriculture, okay, agriculture taxation. Um, I am a, a, a agribusiness undergrad, and, and one of the things that we try to do is show people the agribusiness way, okay? And as I was um, listening this morning, you know, we, we also have a, a insurance a, a company called Agribusiness Crop Insurance Group. Um, we are a crop insurance agent, a agency, but we serve 15 states throughout the United States, and we are steadily growing. But for the uh, agriculture um, side of, of the tenant group, is one of the things that we are trying to educate our farmers on is the fact that you are agribusiness men and women, okay? A lot of people um, f feel that agriculture is almost like the a set aside, but agriculture, like I tell people a lot of times, the, the super rich invest in agriculture because of the taxable deductible that they, they utilize. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of the super rich is one of the biggest investments. I was on the phone with some VCs, venture capitalists out of uh, Silicon Valley. That's one of the areas that they're looking at now is because of agriculture, the taxation, the structures, and different things, how agriculture works. So I just want to um, say I'm a pleasure to be here this morning. Now, I, I absolutely encourage everyone, please, to ask questions, stop us, you know, um, I think there's a way you can raise your hand or just say, hey, I have a question. We do a lot of, we've been doing a lot of Zooms um, lately due to the um, COVID-19 virus. I hope everyone is safe. And as soon as that we get off the Zoom, um, our phone don't start ringing. And the first thing people say is that, well, I, I didn't want to ask that question. I didn't, uh, didn't understand it. 
or a person saying, hey, so I was just too embarrassed to, to ask. Please do not, not hang up, do not get off the Zoom. Of course, we're going to give information to call if you If you need clarity, if you don't understand, ask. Because our goal is we want you to know it. Our, our motto is you're in the business, we take care of the company, but we want you to understand the information that we're about to give to you, okay? Now, <laughs> excuse me, if I'm correct on here, I think we're going to be talking for from 9 to 11. Is, am I correct or 9 to 12? 9 to 12. 9 to 12. That's, that's our problem, okay? So if, if they want to get ready to get started, I'll go ahead and get started. Ready. <clears throat> okay. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... Again, again, my name is Director Tenney, and from the Tenney Group. And our mission, as we clearly say, is to educate and empower everyone to understand accountability to ensure a sustainability with a solid foundation. Okay. And one of the people, one of the things that we try to show people now from the agriculture community is this is the agribusiness way. We work with farmers throughout multiple states across the country now. And so we see a lot of differences, we see a lot of things, but the one thing that's most important now is structure in agriculture, foundation in agriculture. That is absolutely important, okay? I always have to give this quick disclaimer here. Um, the next slide, I have, let me see if we can advance here. Um, this information that you will hear today regarding entities of a tax person only and its relations. We're not lawyers, but we rec we can recommend you lawyers we work with that can provide you with legal advice or information. That's a screen that we have to we have to give. Okay. All right. Now, our purpose is to provide consultancy and training and service in financial planning and business management. Our goal is to educate, assist, and develop a solid foundation best business price and structure, and identify and develop solid financial management strategies through training and professional development, okay? And one of the things that we want to do, we want to make sure that people understand accountability. Now, we have a lot of people that was working with a lot of agriculture communities now, and due to the um, economical downturn due to COVID-19, uh, a lot of our farmers, our agriculturists, have missed opportunities in fundings and programs, okay? Now, I wanna make this very clear. A lot of those programs are still there for agriculture, okay? A lot of people um, didn't understand how it works, but we're gonna to touch bases briefly in this as well, okay? So what are you, okay? You was told that you was a business entity, but was established, but what does that mean to you? And the next few sli slides, we develop and define in different types of business entities, okay? All right, now, business entities, okay? Sole proprietorship, partnership, S corporation, C corporation, and nonprofits. But I always say the one in the middle, limited liability companies, okay? I, I ask this question, I hope people can hear me, people can say yes, if, if, if they're muted, that's fine. How many people, uh, um, Ever heard of limited liability companies? Okay. Okay. LLCs, um, I, I didn't hear too much more, but maybe, maybe muted, but a limited liability companies is one way, the one thing that has most people in, 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 in trouble. They don't understand how LLCs work. Okay. So, a partnership, okay, is the individual itself, S corporation, C corporations, and a lot of people. Everyone I spoke with, not say everyone, a lot of people I talk to say, I want to have a nonprofit. Okay, and I tell people all the time, nonprofit is good for the purpose you may want to utilize, but nonprofit is not the way to go if you're trying to build an entity, uh, develop profitable entities. Now, a nonprofit is a great way to go to implement programs, but you must collaborate with a for profit who understands how to implement your program. A lot of people say, for example, if I want to Teach every child in Virginia how to grow tomatoes. There's nothing wrong with developing a nonprofit, seeking funding for it, seeking funding programs for it, okay, to teach every child how to grow tomatoes. But the best thing to do is that the nonprofit can develop the program, how to grow tomatoes, and go out and collaborate with a farmer who knows how to do it. This is one of the biggest things that a lot of people um, don't understand about nonprofits. Excuse me, I think I have a question. Okay. Uh, uh, the, can, uh, is our slides advancing? Can y'all see the advancement in the slides? No. I no. do apologize. I, I'm sorry. They're working on that. Okay. All 
I do apologize. We technology something sometimes. There we go. Okay, is it advancing now? Yes. Okay, I apologize about that. I apologize about that. Okay. Now I'm, I'm testing out. Did, did, did it advance? Do y'all see it advancing? Yes, it's on the business entities right now. Okay. But it hasn't changed. No. Okay. So we, we, Okay, we're we'll, we'll gonna work on it right now. Apologize, they're working on it now. See an hourglass, hit the hourglass, and if you wanna move forward, hit the enter button. If you wanna move back, hit the back space button. Mm -hmm. um, if you would go up to the slideshow and then you should see um, presentation. You can advance it manually. Right. We may have a zip, right? Yeah. yeah. We got a new screen now. Okay. Looks like a tax form. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, we're working on right now. We do this quite a bit, but every now and then we, we get hiccups with it. You don't have to do it. Okay, like this right here. Okay, like this. Okay, all right. I apologize. Is it advancing now? Yes. Yes. Do you yeah. see all this right here? Yeah. Okay. Can we make it? We're going to try to make it so you won't see all the other backgrounds and stuff. Can y'all work on it? Okay. Right, so, I'm sorry about this. We apologize about click, that. Mr. Ten, I click on slideshow. Mm -hmm. He's click on right okay. okay. From from current slide. That's what I did. From current slide. Go up just a little bit. Okay. Can Is it advancing it? now? It's on five, page five. No, it's not advancing. It's not, it's not you have to go back to the yeah. Okay. I'm 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 gonna go to the other the other route manually. Can y'all can y'all see advances now? I see the page. What are you? Okay. All right. We're gonna go we're gonna go it from here. Okay, and I do apologize about that. Maybe at a break with which we'll work on and try to get it fixed and stuff. I do apologize about that. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, okay, as I was talking about what are you, okay, now, do we see the, the different types of business entities? Yes. Okay, I can move from here, okay? All right, again, as I was saying, so we're proud to share a partnership, S Corporation, C Corporation, Nonprofit, and Limited Liability Companies, okay? Limited Liability Companies is one of the ways that a lot of our individuals have had problems in understanding how that works, okay? So as we get further into we're going to discuss the difference in the entities and how it affects you from a taxation perspective and also a professional perspective, okay? All right, now, I want to make sure everyone sees. Do everyone see the next slide, say SS4 form? Yes. Okay. Can I, can I interrupt right quick as well, too? What is, a, are we going to be able to talk about B Corporation since that is a newer entity that is now um, allowed in the state of Virginia? Now, I don't have the information in this presentation about the B Corporation now, okay? Now, I don't have that information about the B Corporation in this slide, okay? okay. And but what I can do, I will do a follow-up with you. We, 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 we don't have that information yet here, okay? okay? But I will, we will be following with you on that B Corporation, okay? All right, sir, All right. appreciate it. Yes, we will. Do. We'll, I want to make sure we get your name information and we'll follow the meeting today on that, okay? We do do a lot of structures in Virginia. Uh, we are doing we are doing a lot of structures in Virginia, so we will definitely um, get information for you. Okay, all right, all right. Now, one of the things here, this form right here is called your SS4 form, uh, so commonly called the EIN number. Okay, do everyone have an EIN number? Okay, and I'm asking questions in regards. To, maybe I would say, but an EIN number. This form right here is the most important piece of paper you can have in business structure development or continuation is your EIN number. Comment for is SS4 form. A lot of people ask me all the time, do I need an EIN number? The answer is no. Should I have an EIN number? The answer is yes. The employee identification number is one, is one of the ways in which we now are uh, how the IRS tracks you, okay? In the EIN number, number one, 
No one reads this form. When they get this, when they get an EIN number, they give you a letter or a letter only one time, okay? No one reads it, okay? Because it clearly tells you what should you do. But the problem that people have with EIN number is not your name, address, and location. Is when you get around a 9A, it asks you what type of entity you are, okay? If you check that box that says sole proprietorship, then you're telling them that you're a 1060, that you're a individual 1040. If you check partnership, you, you just told the IRS, I'm going to file a 1065 partnership. Now, if you check corporation, you're going to tell the IRS that now I'm going to file an 1120 or 1120S. When you fill these forms, if you say personal corporation, if you say church, the church is not required to file a tax return if it's deemed to be recognized as a religious organization of being a church, okay? But the biggest thing with the EIN number is when people check these boxes, you just told them your requirements, but no one fills it out um, correctly, okay? In understanding what your requirements are is important before you get your EIN number, okay? Now, the one biggest problem that people have with, the e, with EIN numbers and limited liability companies is understanding the fact that a LLC has three different ways to file, okay? Now, here's what I mean. Once you form a limited liability company or a corporation, if the box, the form is going to ask you where people were in trouble, are you a single member LLC, okay? If, say, um, Ms. Barlow, I'm, I see, I, I'm just reading her name, say Ms. Barlow, say, for, say I want to form an LLC, okay? And it asks you, if you're a single member LLC, what, what will most people do? Say yes. Yeah. Correct? Okay. Now, and I'm just going by names I see here, okay? If, if Ms. Barlow and Ms. And, uh, Ms. Shana Edwards say, I'm going to form an LLC, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's going to ask you that question. Are you a multi-member LLC? Most people are going to say, yes, I'm a multi-member LLC. But when most people form an LLC, the intentions are for it to be, this is my limited liability company, and this is me. We intend to be separate, a totally separate entity, correct? Yeah, well, yeah. what happens is, with a limited liability company, when they ask you, are you a single member LLC? And if they ask you, are you a multi-member LLC? If your intentions are to be taxed totally separate from your LLC, you need to check corporation. Because when you check you are a single member LLC, you just told the IRS, I'm a file as a sole proprietorship. If you check that you are a multi-member LLC, you just told the IRS, I'm going to file as a 1065 partnership. But if you check corporation, now you form your LLC as a corporation, but you have 75 days to file the articles of election to be taxed as a corporation. That's where most people mess up from that aspect of it, okay? All right. This is a question. Now, I can't see the question because of the way we get it. We're going to work as when we take a break. A question was, have an EIN, but select wrong entity. Can they change? Yes, it can be changed. Okay? There's several ways you can change it. Now, if you have an EIN number and you want it to be a particular entity, if you want it to be a part, a corporation, we have the form of 2553 to change it. Okay? Now, a lot of people ask that question, can I change my entity structure? The answer is yes, you can. Okay? All right? Yes, you can. And as we get information from each individual, we'll give you a call to talk to you because a lot of people, if they don't mind, we don't like discussing people um, first over, over Zoom, but we can follow up with you on that. So the answer is yes. We show you how to change it. Okay? All right? So again now, here's why the EIN number is the most important piece of paper in business structure development. And here's where most people mess up from the, from the absolute beginning because of the way you check that. So we so we will show you exactly how that works. So again, now, wherever you, wherever you check is what your file requirements are. But we're going to, as further down in our presentation, 
We're going to tell you how to correct all this, and we're going to also tell you how it works from a limited liability company, okay? So next slide, okay? The next slide. Sole proprietorship. What does it mean for us to be a sole proprietorship, okay? Also call it independent contract, consultant, or freelancer. One person oper op operation. The business may have a number of employees or hired persons, but the proprietor is own, runs, and manage the businesses. No forms required to start this type of business. Only report the income and expenses of the business on Schedule C. And remember that word when I say the Schedule C, okay? A sober product, a sober product ship, the advantage of a sober product is very easy to organize, okay? People wake up, somebody can wake up this morning and say, I want to start a business. Guess what? That's a sober product ship, okay? On stream, make decisions, minimum legal restrictions, only receives all profits, okay? Easy to discontinue, okay? Now, the biggest disadvantage of a sole proprietorship is one unlimited liability of the owner, okay? Limited ability to raise capital, skills limited to the owner's abilities, and fringe benefits are restricted. We get further than that. What a sole proprietorship is, it's simple as saying, a one person. Now, if you have ABC Farms, the only disadvantage to a sole proprietorship, you are totally responsible and you receive all income. If you have ABC Farms, okay, and you say, my name is Darrell Tenney, I have ABC Farms. And my ABC Farms when I made $50,000 this year, okay? Technically, ABC Farms didn't make one dime. You, the individual, made the $50,000. Okay, I'll repeat that. As a sole proprietorship, a lot of people come up and say, I have a business entity, okay? It's direct tenant enterprises, okay? Guess what? They're assuming at the end of the year when you come in, that entity made all the money. No, they didn't. You, the individual, made all the money. You, the individual, is responsible for all the money, okay? That's the biggest thing about a sole um, proprietorship. Now, the biggest thing about a sole proprietorship is that it is. It has unlimited. It, it has unlimited liability. If you have a farm, ABC Farms goes out, hits someone, then that individual opens you up for personal liability because you operate as a sole proprietor. Okay, you operate as a sole proprietor. Okay. Now, the one thing about a sole proprietorship, you must reduce taxable income. I, I, as I said, the fifty thousand dollars if you make on your farm today, it's all get, went to the individual. Now, here's what we, what we talk about when we say reducing the tax of income, okay? The biggest thing about that is here's a form that and where you file a sober proprietorship on a form schedule C, okay? I repeat, here's where you file a sober proprietorship on a form schedule C. You have one thing about this form here. If you see line one, gross receipts, okay? And all your expenses will follow. But let me say this now. If you are in any type of agricultural operation, you do not use this form. I'm going to repeat that. If you are in, in any type of agricultural operation, a Schedule C is one form you do not use. We get this all the time. This is for ordinary business. A farm, a, a farm operation is not considered ordinary business. That is agriculture. The form is a schedule air for as we get into it. So let me repeat this one last time. We get this all the time throughout the country. Schedule C's are for ordinary business. It's not for agriculture. Okay? All right. So here we go again. And I, I point out this line here, line one for a specific purpose. I want everyone to remember that line on a Schedule C, because on a Schedule C, it says gross receipts for ordinary business, okay? All right, now, we're going to talk about legal business deduction expenses, okay? For, and there's some individuals on, on the call who may not be uh, in farm operation, but here's what we mean by deductible, advertising, car and truck, commission, contract labor, depletion, depreciation, employee benefits. These are all types of legal business deductions for a sole partnership. Insurance, interest, legal professional fees, office expense, pension insurance, okay? Now, rent lease, repair and maintenance, supplies, tax and license, 
travel, meals, utilities, and wages. These are all legal tax deduction, but not exhausted list. Okay. But here again, the reason that we show individuals um, um, the legal deductions on an RDF business business because of the similarity of Schedule F. It's pretty much the, almost the same thing, but we're going to explain why there's a difference. Okay. Now we're going to talk about farm income and farm expenses. Okay. This section will identify portion of income, sources, and expenses you may incur on your daily farm operation, okay? Your daily farm operation. Now, you remember when I showed you um, the Schedule C, okay? In line one, it says gross receipts, okay? The reason that I pointed that out was is because in farm, in, in farm income, you do not report it on one line. Here's how you separate farm income. Sales of livestock and other resale, okay? You always separate farm income. Costs and other basis of livestock or other items reported on line A. And you see beside line A, we have a minus. This is the cost basis of livestock, used for livestock, okay? When I say that meaning, if you bought a bull for $2,000 and you sold it for $4,000, you need to subtract the cost basis of that bull. The cost basis was $2,000, okay? Sales of livestock, produce, and grains, and other products you raise. Here's why I'm, I'm put a pin right here. A lot of individuals get line one and line three mixed up. Line one says, sales of livestock and other resale items. If you bought some apples and you said, I want to sell them, that's where you put that profit at because it was a resale. But sales and livestock are produce grains and other products you raise. If you raise the apples and so here's where you put that income. Most people get that mixed up now. Because line one is for resale. Line three is for what you raised, okay? You grew in a garden, you grew cucumbers, tomatoes, as long as you raised it, okay? Corporate distribution payments, agriculture program payments, commodity credit corporation CCC loans, crop insurance proceeds, of federal, and federal crop disaster programs. Remember now, being a crop insurance agent, what a lot of people don't understand is, if you receive crop insurance proceeds, you may qualify to not have to report it due that year. You could avert, defer it to the following year. A lot of times, it's four qualifying factors. If you receive proceeds, you may not have to report them in this year. You can defer them to another year. And we're going to show you how that works as well. Custom higher income, other income, and gross income. Now, when it comes down to Agriculture income. This is the only way you report agriculture income. And I tell clients and people specifically, in agriculture income, you must always separate that income. I'm going to say it again. Separate the income. Any agriculture income, and when it comes to agriculture, here is the only way you report agriculture income and expenses is a Schedule F. Okay, now here's what I mean by the Schedule F. As we just talked about um, the agriculture expense and income, as you see on line one, sales and livestock. Okay, you see line two, B, where you just track the cost basis. Okay, number two, sales and livestock, other products you raise. Now, I want to pay close attention to 3A, 4A, and I want people to look at 5A and 6A. And versus 3B, 4B, 5B, CB, and 6D. Here's what I mean by that, okay? When we stated earlier, when I just stated earlier, deferred income, I'm going to use agriculture income, agriculture um, as, as number one. If we go down to um, crop insurance line six, okay? We use what I class a lot, okay? If you receive, say, $100,000 for your crop insurance proceeds this year, okay? But due to the disaster, you were forced to sell livestock, various other items, you may qualify to where you do not have to report that as taxable income this year, okay? In line 6A, 
you will put the hundred thousand dollars. But in line six B, you will put zero because you're not reporting as taxable income this year. Now you told the IRS I got it now. Don't get me wrong now. But you told the IRS on line six A it's not taxable this year. Okay. Here's why in agricultural income, you absolutely do not use a Schedule C. On line one of the Schedule C, it says gross receipts, one time, one place. But you don't have any places on the Schedule C to defer that income. A lot of our farmers, this is not a Virginia issue, this is not a North Carolina issue, it's a South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Arkansas, Texas. We have clients throughout the country. And a lot of our farmers, some are not using, didn't know not to use the Schedule C. A lot of farmers are paying taxes they don't owe. They were fat, in which we can go back and amend that because they were using the wrong form. Okay? Now, here's why it's important of that Schedule L. Okay? As well, the next section is your the expenses. Now, before I continue, is there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. The next section, I'm going back to what I are you? Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. But suppose I have apples, I brew them, and I, mm -hmm. I now produce the apples in an apple pie. I sold the apple pie. That's C or F. Mm -hmm. So you say you 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 produce the apples and you sell it in apple pies, correct? Yeah, or like blackberries and the blackberry wine. The retail you, of wine or the apple pie is that F or C? Okay. So what you're saying, if I want to say it correctly, you grew some apples, okay? And you you made apple pies with those apples, correct? So your right. question is, where would what where would you put your income, correct? You need to report the income that you receive from the apple pies, okay? Because you're going to capture all expenses on a Schedule F. Now, if you keep it like that, you're going to record all expenses on a Schedule F, but the income would mean that you grew, you grew the apples, you put them in a pie, and you sold it, okay? So you combine that operation as one, correct? Yeah. Now... Exactly how I said the best way to do it is file the, the agriculture the apple pies on the other income. Now, remember now, here we go. If you look at line nine, it says go other income because you didn't report the money that you made from selling apple pie to a, a processor. You, you, you didn't report. So basically, you have to put that as other income. Okay? Now, if you sold the apples to sales of livestock on produce grains you raised to a processor and receive income, yes, you report you report income on that line. You understand? But because you made apple pies and you sold it as apple pies, you have to report it under gross income because you you use the apples to make the pies to sell. Because now, if you sell the apples and then take some of them and make apple pies. You report the sales you sold on line two of what you raised, and you report the rest of it on the sales you sold from the apple pies. Does that make sense? Um, I kind of got lost in some of it, but we can talk later. Okay. But let me tell you the best way. That, what, I, what I was saying, when I, and, and look, we got time to explain it to you. Because you made money off the apples, from the pies itself, they report as other income, and it could be on a Schedule F because you raised it on a farm. But if you took the apples and say, I'm going to sell it to a processor, and here's going to, I'm going to take my orchard and I'm going to sell a thousand pounds of apples. Here's your check for a thousand pounds of apples. You report that on the sales of livestock and produce and grains you raised because you sold the apples directly to a buyer, correct? But now, if you didn't sell the apples to a buyer and you used the apples to make your pies, and then you sold the pies to a buyer, now you report there's other income. I got that part. Okay. okay. But 
Let me give you the best advice the way that share works, okay? Now, you got to follow, right? I want to create an entity. What's your name, sir, if you don't mind asking? Can you hear me? The Doug Star, yeah. Mr. Doug, I, I want to create Doug's Farm, okay? Now, Doug's Farm is going to grow those apples. You're going to have, you're going to go out here and put your seat, you're going to put your fertilizer, you're going to put your chemicals, you're going to put all, you're going to use our conservation expenses. Doug Farms grew the apple. Now, Mr. Doug's Farm is going to sell pies. But what I would have done, I would have created Mr. Doug's Farm Apple Pies as another LLC. Okay? Now, you got Doug's Farms as your LLC, Farms LLC. Doug's Farm Apple Pies as your second LLC. So what's going to happen here, Doug's Farm is going to grow those apples. And Doug's Farms Apple Pie is going to buy them from Doug's Farms. I got that now. Okay. Okay? So Doug's Farms is not going to grow and sell the pies. Doug's Farm is going to grow the apple, pie, grow the apple pies. So guess what? Now, if you look at my screen here, Doug Farms got legal business expenses on the farms. He got car and truck expense. Mr. Doug Farms got chemical expense. Mr. Doug Farms got co conservation expense. Mr. Doug Farms got custom hire depreciation because all the equipment that you have to grow those apples for the apple pies need to be depreciated. Okay? One thing about appreciation, you recapture appreciation. Appreciation goes over a certain period of time. If your company says, your, your company says, I made $10,000. But I had $20,000 in depreciation. Your company now made $30,000 because you add depreciation to it. Now, if your company says, I lost $10,000, but my company had $10,000, $20,000 depreciation, my company now made $10,000 because you subtract depreciation. You always add depreciation back in, okay? But as I continue, those farms have employees' benefits, fee, fertilizer, Freight and trucking, gasoline, insurance, mortgage interest, okay? Other interests, labor hire, pension, rent, vehicles, land animals, repair maintenance, seeds, plants, storage, supplies, taxes, utilities, and veterinary and breeding expenses, but you don't have that for um, um, your growing apples. The reason I pointed that out is because now Doug Farms has all these legal tax deductions to reduce Doug Farms' income. But guess what? Now Doug Farm is going to have Doug's apple um, 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 farm, apple pies farm, apple pies, Doug apple pies. Doug apple pies now also have the exact same expenses as a separate entity. You have the exact same expenses as a separate entity. Doug's farm can reduce chemicals and conservation expenses and custom hire. Those apple pie can also reduce chemicals, possibly if you use it uh, and make an apple pie, spraying with apple pies on the unit's apple. Does apple pie also may not have no fee, but does apple pie also have repair and maintenance and rent? Because does apple pies can rent space from does farm is necessary. Does apple pie say, look, does farm. I want to reserve one acre to grow Granny Smith apples, especially for me. Guess what? Now Doug Apple Pie have rent from Doug's farm because Doug's Apple Pie is renting that acre from Doug's farm to grow my apples exclusively. Does that make sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. Doug, does that make sense? Uh... Yeah, most of it. Thank God I had accounting classes in college. <laughs> don't, worry, don't worry about it. The point I'm trying to say is, the point I'm trying to say is, here's how we structure our, our entities to protect each other for one thing and protect us. The reason I'm going through this scenario is because, Mr. Doug, if, you, if you're growing the apples for the pies and say someone bit, you know, of course, we're going to into the pie and say, look, 
I got sick because of pie. Guess what? Now, because Doug Farm is running as one unit, now they can come back and say, well, I want to sue you for everything. The farm, the apple trees and all, because that's a part of the asset. Now, let me say this now. We're a lot, a lot of lawyers. We are, we, we work with a lot of attorneys, but I'm saying from our speculation. Now, lawyers may tell you different, but the point I'm trying to make is, it, you now combine everything together from a very litigious society. But now, if Doug Apple Pies here, and you have Doug Farms, and Doug Apple Pies sold a pie, and something happens, they can't come back and go to, go to the farm. Because you're selling the pies from Doug Pie, not Doug's farm. And most entities can only be, be litigated for the assets of that entity. So now you, you put, say what now? I like that idea. Because now when you sell the pies, Doug Apple Pies bought it from Doug's farm. But Doug Apple Pies sold the pies. So now you can't go back and litigate Doug's farm. Because they didn't sell the pies. They just grew the apple for the pies. Now that makes sense. Yeah, but I don't lose the farm. They can only take their business, but not the farm. They can only take, they can only litigate against what's the assets of the apple pie business. Okay. There's so many ways around that. Because if you only selling and say that Doug Apple Pies got all these big thumbs to make apple pies, correct? Once your business grow and continues to grow, like I just said, they can come back and, and litigate against Doug Apple Pies, right? But if you got all the equipment itself in another entity, leasing equipment to Doug Apple Pie, guess what? There's no assets in Doug Apple Pies. Because all the assets of the of the pie, to make the pies in another entity as well. That's what he's the further down the line. But the point I'm trying to say, as your company grows, as your business grows, you need to look at how to develop business and interest structure to protect you against that, okay? All right? That's the purpose now of looking at financial statements, which we're going to get further into, on how to make entities work for you, how to make entities protect you, okay? So in your situation, Mr. Doug, as you continue to grow, I will look at creating two separate entities, two separate LLCs, one for the farm and one for the pies. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do. That. I'm gonna do that right now. I'm a sole proprietor. Do I need a new FBIN now, or can I use that same one and just change the structure? You can use the same one to change it. But as I tell all my clients, okay, we look at them more. We do corporate structure for people. We do quite a bit in Virginia as well. I look at how long you had an EIN number. Have you ever used it for anything else? Now, if you want to structure a new entity, now if I had an EIN number, say, three years ago, and I am structuring a brand new entity, yes, I'm probably going to get a new EIN number. But if you use the EIN number, but now you have no liability against it now. A lot of people, we've had people that use their old EIN numbers as we restructure new companies. But the old EIN numbers had tax debt towards it. The old EIN number had, had liabilities against it. So you're going to bring that to the new company now. Just remember that now. And I say you do have that. I'm just giving you scenarios and examples, okay? When you create a new entity, and a lot of people have had, already had the EIN number, if you know, as we use the word, if this is a clean EIN number, then you can use it. We, well, all we got to do, once we file an article, a, a corporation, everything. But now, another thing about that too as well, if you got an EIN number three years ago under uh, Mr. Doug, but you say Doug's Farms. When we create that entity, it has to match that name. It has to match that name. You can't have Doug's Farm and get an EIN number and say Doug's Apple Farm. You can't do that. It's got to say Doug's Farm, whatever you've got an EIN number under, okay? Under your name, all right? You can use it if you already got bank accounts, if you already got situations with processes. Some people say Durell is very difficult for us to. Uh, change our EIN number, we pick up the phone, we call the EIN department and make sure there's no liabilities against that EIN number. If it's not, we can use the same one, okay? All right? So, yes, the, the answer is, do you need to get a new EIN number? The answer is no. Would I advise sometimes get new EIN numbers? Yes, according to how much work you did with it, okay? All right? 
I think he was trying to ask you if he formed that second LLC, did he need another EIN number for that one as well? Yes. Now, if I've misunderstood, yes. Now, if you got a second LLC, absolutely. You would have a different name and a different EIN number. Okay. Yes, you will. Okay. If you find that second one, you need to. Now, as you operate as a sole proprietor, Mr. Doug, as I said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what I will tell people now, again, Mr. Doug, I would strongly look at creating a limited liability company. Now, remember now, an LLC can also operate as a sole proprietorship now. Would I recommend it? No. Can, do we have people to do it? Yes. Some people may not have a big operation. They may say, I just want to grow one tree. That's it. Okay, you might need a corporation to grow one tree. But if you're growing orchards of apples and you create and you sell a piles of apples, absolutely. It's not how much money we make, it's how we receive the money. I'm gonna repeat what I just said now. It's not how much money you make, it's how you receive it. Is Mr. Doug gonna receive the money or is Mr. Doug Apple Pie gonna receive the money? That's the purpose. How to how to receive money. Here's where people get taxes on money. So again, I'm talking about this right right quickly on the expenses that y'all see here. These are all your legal tax deductible expenses for agriculture. Now I'm gonna say it, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay. If you got if you see these expenses here, these are expenses that follow fall straight through to the schedule F here. And the schedule F at the bottom line, you see a bunch of lines. If you do not see, if you do not see your expenditure and you may not know which category to go in, just write it down. If you bought a refrigerator to cool the apples and you didn't you don't see refrigerator, write refrigerator down, eight hundred dollars as a cost. Of course that's equipment, but you may not classify as equipment. So I tell people all the time, we get this a lot. People say, I didn't see where I can record that expenses. I don't know what category it goes under. If you're not certain, write it down. If you bought a freezer, write freezer eight hundred dollars. If you bought a lamp, you write lamp $800. If you don't know where it goes, just write it down and, and, you, and, and, and it list the cost, period. Okay? All right? Now, are there any questions so far? Mr. Tenna, this uh, is um, Shonda Edwards. I have mm -hmm. a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, the two LLCs that you recommended for Doug, how mm -hmm. is that different from um, a DBA? Okay. A DBA is simple doing business as. A DBA is not an entity unless you put on your Secretary of State or organization, or organization or incorporation doing business as. A DBA is simply is saying, I'm the rare tenant doing business as Apple Farms. Please, just use Apple Farms. You, you really... The only person of a DBA is what you want to put on your sign outside your business or on your uh, facility. Okay? Here's what I mean by that. If you say my farm is, my business name is Darrell Farms, DBA as doing as Darrell's apples. The IRS don't care about Darrell apples. All the, the IRS care about is what your EIN name is. And that's how you file your taxes, by the entity name, okay? Doing business as is, if you want to say, the rare tenant, doing business as a flower shop, that's your DBA. But the rare tenant is a company, name, structure, and the IRS, only thing the IRS knows is the rare tenant, okay? Okay. That helps. Yeah, that, that helps. I do have one more quick question. Please. Okay. I'm on y'all time. Okay. Um, let's say you got um a grant from NCRS for a high tunnel. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have to file? Absolutely. And if you get a 1099, okay, I'm gonna go back to this this, this page, okay? If you get a 1099, the answer is yes. Okay. Now, and most times. That goes on the conservation expenses. Okay, you got a grant, right? Sometimes grants go on conservation expenses, sometimes grants go on it. So if you got a grant, 
Now I'm gonna go back to this form here. You said you got it. Did it give you a 1099 for high tunnels? I haven't had it yet. I okay. Had it. If you get a 1099, you absolutely have to have to record that. Okay. On the grant pro on the programs. Okay. Now, but here's a problem now. If you got a grant for a high tunnel, you got to keep up with all the expenses of the high tunnel. Okay. If you bought the plastic, the lumber, whatever. We get this all the time. People get um um ask me, said the rare is conservation expense deductible. Absolutely conservation expense deductible. Because if you got a grant for a hundred thousand dollars, but you spent a hundred and one thousand dollars, there's no tax to pay. Just like for yourself. If you got a grant for high tunnel, and say you got a grant for say twenty thousand dollars, but it costs you nineteen thousand dollars the lumber, the nails, the plastic, all the everything associated with it, you need to write, you need to record those expenses on section two of the schedule F. The problem what people get is we get these grants money, and a lot of people say it's a grant, I don't have to pay the money back. Well, some grants you get a 1099, and it's taxable. But if it's not taxable, at, you said a line on four here, agricultural program payments. If you got agricultural program payments, some type of agricultural program payment, and it's not taxable, it, it lists that, you put it in 4A, but you don't put it in 4B, okay? So the biggest thing is on your grants, on your on your, what you receive, keep up with all the expenses in constructing constructing the hot tunnel. Okay. Thank you. All right. And and, and, that, and that was a great quote. What, what's your name, ma'am? Shonda Edwards. Miss Miss Edwards, that was a great question because we run into that all the time when it comes down to taxation at the end of the year. I'm using this time as an example. Say if she got a, a, a grant in, in 2020, okay? We're getting ready to do taxes two months from now. Most people come in and say, I got all this, the all these agriculture program payments. I got grant money. So we say, okay, you owe taxes. Well, it's an agriculture was grant. I don't suppose. I said, did you get a 1099? Well, they gave me a 1099. Well, if they gave you 1099, that means it's taxable. Then I will ask you, where are all the expenses associated with this money that you receive to improve or to add or to build a high tunnel. First question get, I didn't keep them. I didn't know I, was, I, I didn't know I, was, I, I had to keep them. You got to keep all expenses to reduce tax income. Okay. And I always use an example here. Okay. If your farm went out here today and you made a hundred dollars on your farm today. Okay. And you say, well, you know, I'm going to, you know, most people at home now, but I'm going to go out to, 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 to Walmart today, and I'm going to um, buy some um, office supplies so I can listen to this guy talk about agriculture. Number one, first of all, if you said you went out today and you spent $50 in fuel today, okay, next year, your tax income is only going to be $50 because you subtract the fuel. If you say I, I spent $20 in office supplies, okay, to write down everything that we hear today, guess what? Next year's time, that $100 is only going to be taxed at $30. But all the way back from Walmart to get back to the business room, you have a blowout. Guess what? And you spent $40 in repairing maintenance. Next year's time, you have zero tax income because you spent $50 in fuel, you spent $20 in um, office supplies, and you spent $40 in repair and maintenance. Now, office repair and maintenance fuel offset, but I'm using an example here. You spent $40 in repair and maintenance. So the hundred dollars you made today, you've already lost a negative ten dollars. So next year this time, there's no taxes to pay. But if you made a hundred dollars on your farm today and you don't keep up with no expenses, guess what? You're gonna pay you're gonna pay tax on a whole hundred dollars. Taxes are only paid on what's left over. Taxes are only paid for what, what's left over. Okay. Now uh, I got a question. Um, are the uh, care Act funds that they went to some commodity producers taxable? Now, when you say care Act funds, most of the most of the care Act funds were loans and grants. So the answer is no. Okay. So most of the care Act funds was loans and grants. So the answer, the answer is no. Okay. All right. But let me say this about, as I'm talking about, a perfect segue into expenses. As we are now going through forgiveness programs, 
As we are now, they are now making sure a lot of these care act funds and programs, they're asking for proof of expenditures on some of them now, okay? So it's very, very important that we make sure you are keeping accountability of all your expenditures, okay? All right, okay? Now, we into the Schedule F. I went through how to reduce tax income. Now we're going to get into disregarded entities, okay? Now, before I, before I move on from a Schedule F and move Schedule Fs and stuff, are there any questions about how you file on a taxable income, how you file taxable income on Schedule F? As we, gain, as we go further into the entries now, remember now, you always in agriculture, you always file a schedule F regardless. I'm going to explain it to you, okay? Now, um, as we talk about, um, uh, as, uh, next, uh, one other form we, we introduce people, 4835, farm rental income and expenses, okay? Yeah, although you use schedule F for rental, but a lot of people are landowners. A lot of people, a lot of people use a schedule F for land rentals, or you can use a 4835, farm rental income and expenses. These are, this form is for people who rent out land, okay? Landowners, we simply talk about that. Now, we're going to get into disregarded entities next, okay? Our next one is called disregarded entities, okay? Now, a disregarded entity who is also called a pastor entities. A lot of people, once you form your LLCs, once you form your, your, your C-Corps, I mean your S-Corps, that's called a pass-through, okay? Uh, it's one that is distinct from the owner and for some purposes, but not when it comes to taxes. So proprietorships and partnerships, for example, are disregarded in is because the owners of these corporations report their business income and expenses on their personal tax return. A Schedule C is on your personal tax return. That's a sole proprietorship, okay? A lot of people ask me, if I'm a sole proprietorship, where do I report that? What tax form do I use? You, you use the Schedule C, or you use the Schedule C, or you use the Schedule F. That's a sole proprietor. It goes to you personally, okay? Corporations are generally an example of business entity that's not disregarded, okay? Except for S Corporation, R RIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. A corporation generally pay taxes on its profits before distribution to shareholders, okay? Now, we're going we're gonna to get into what I'm talking about here, okay? Now, a partnership, an aggregate of owners, two or more persons contributed their assets to the business and may share management responsibility, profit and losses. Each partner pledges faith in the other partner and stands liable of this actions of all partners within the scope of activities, okay? Now, Here's a the disadvantage advantage of partnership. A partnership is just like a corporation. I mean, a, a sole partnership. It's just two or more members, okay? Two or more members, okay? I, I have a question. If we have a family member's kids helping on the farm, what expense can be deducted on them? Are they treated as employees at what age? Yes, number one. Yes, they are treated as employees, okay? Now, what age? You got to go by your state um, laws with child labor now, okay? It ain't like it used to be now, okay? I remember when we growing up, you know, seven, eight years old, we sat on a tractor holding that tractor in the road. I grew up in the back of country, okay? And we grew up on that holding, holding tractors in the road and stuff um, um, out here seven, eight years old. I remember when butt boys came in, you know, our uncle had to, to, to try to lift those boxes up. You didn't have enough weight on the front of that tractor. He took them from that tractor. You can't do that now, no. especially with child and labor laws, right? like it used to be. So can your youth work for you? Absolutely. Okay. Now, what uh, what expenses can you deduct from them? Any expenses or so with operating that business. Payroll, that's your number one expense, okay, that you could deduct for a person working with you is your payroll. Now, one thing, and we was going to get in that little later, but I'll go ahead and jump into it now. Payroll is one thing that most people do not do as agriculturists. We don't pay ourselves from our farms. You must pay yourself from your farms, okay? Reason being because you have payroll expense that you file in 943. But one thing about paying yourself from your, from your operation, and your children now, remember now. Number one, Social Security. Number two, Medicare. But it's one thing that people miss when you pay yourself from your farm or any operation, is unemployment. You qualify for unemployment when you pay yourself from your own entity, okay? Those children, 
if they if we work seasonal, perhaps where they got most states are different, laws are different in what your quarters are, your amount, they now can qualify for unemployment. Okay, things get slow. You go home. Guess what? You can qualify for unemployment. So it's very good that you utilize children or family members, but again, they can be paid, and the biggest expense to payroll for them of to them is payroll. Okay. Now, if they're conducting a business for you, they utilize any of their personal funds. That's that's reimbursable. That's a deduction as well. Okay. But again, now, as we talk about the um, um, age limit, yes, they're employees, but we need to go by the state guidelines. Uh, most people 16, 17, 18 years old. But again, now, if certain rules are apply for certain age limit, what equipment they can't work around. Um, in agriculture, there's certain chemicals they can't work around under 18 years old. Um, certain state rules apply. So remember now, you have to be very leery um, of what age you use, but making sure you understand the labor law in your state in regards to agricultural um, um, employees. Because remember now, agricultural is a very dangerous um, 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 job, you know, for a lot of people and stuff, okay? Because it's susceptible to the equipment, chemicals. I know we work with um, kids in restaurants at a certain age, they can't be around knives. They can't be around cutting boards. So these are things we have to be aware of, okay? All right? All right. So please keep sending the questions or do not hesitate to say, could you ask me to stop one minute and I can and ask those questions, okay? If anyone got any questions, do, do not hesitate to stop me, okay? All right. Can and I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. Can you claim your health insurance and their health insurance if you employ them? If you employ them. If you pay their health insurance, yes. Okay? If they're your employees, yes, you can. Because there's employee programs now, okay? But it's got to be set up as a benefit under employee program. Okay? All right? All right. Any more questions? Again, please do not hesitate to stop me. Any more questions? I do. I Go ahead. Please. I'm, I'm listening. I had a question about employing your children. Um, so if you do that, how do you, what, what kind of record keeping, I guess, do you need to set up? I guess my understanding is if you are paying your family member, you don't have to pay them the same employment taxes as if you were employing someone unrelated to you, but how do you, what do you recommend for record keeping for them? Uh, uh I would recommend a payroll system that you are paying them and you're taking out their Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment. Now, I'll be honest, I have not heard that a family member, I heard, you know, this, you know, there's other deduction if your family member are paying family members, but as for employee, as being them as an employee, they're just like an employee. All right. Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment. So what system I use? A system that can keep up with payroll. Okay. Um, whether it be ADP, whether it be QuickBooks. I mean, we have a payroll department here for our firm that we work with all of our clients in the other, all states and stuff. But a, a simple payroll system that'll keep a, a accurate accountability of Social Security and Medicaid taxes that you're paying, okay? Now, remember now, in agriculture, you don't file a 941, you file a 943. You file an annual report, okay? And you don't file a 941 in agriculture. You file a 943, okay? But I would keep a, just a simple, and I say the word simple, uh, payroll system report. A lot of people go out and get systems they don't understand, okay? All right? Okay. If we use a payroll service, is the service fee deductible? Absolutely. Okay. The service fee is deductible. The computer uses is deductible. The software uses is deductible. If you use a tax account firm, if you use our firm, we have deductible. And if you file taxes, deductible. Yes, ma'am. Any that is legal and professional fees. Okay. So anything associated with establishing payroll and maintaining payroll is deductible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. There's another question. Yeah. Um. This is Andrew Book. Um. We are fairly early stage here and we do not have any income at this point we only have expense and mm -hmm. so what i'm trying to figure is um we're we're not set up as anything other than a sole proprietorship at this point are we able to um put down expenses and then have that as a negative against our other forms of income or is that just going to zero out for us absolutely i only use one thing here yes you got to spend money to make money 
And that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. If I wake up this morning and say I'm going to start a business, you can start at Dutton and Spencer's. Okay, if you drive to Walmart to get a book to say I'm going to get a book on how to grow tomatoes, the gas at Walmart, the book to Walmart, and when you come back and you get on the line, now you have all types of Dutton expenses. Okay, yes, sir. So the biggest thing I tell people. If you are sole proprietorship, if you form an LLC, you still got a startup cost. That's startup cost, okay? And uh, I mean, so many people that we run into, they say, well, I started my business in 2018, but I didn't start at Dutton until 2019. Correction, you need to start at Dutton the day you start your business in 2018, okay? Because what happens if you saw when I, when I saw a sole proprietorship, it says offset income. If you work a, a job, and Mr. Bro Mr. Bro if you work a job and you say, I made 10000 I made $20,000 on a job, okay? But on my business startup, I, I, utilize, I spent $5,000 of my money to start my business. But guess what? If you follow Schedule C, that $20,000 that you make on your job, the tax of income now is down to $15,000. Because you took that money and you utilized to start a business. That's business startup. So the answer is absolutely correct. Okay? Yes. Okay? Great. Thank you. But let me say this to you, a question. A question. A lot of people, I don't remember, a lot of people who form an LLC, correct, to start a business. You say, Miss Bruce, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go ahead and form an LLC, and I'm gonna start a business. Okay. Now, one advantage to that is this: if you said I need to put two thousand dollars into my business, you just loan your business two thousand dollars. Okay. So next year, year after next, year after that. When the, the business start making money, that's a legal tax deduction to subtract the $2,000 for repayments to shareholders equity. You got to repay yourself back from when you start up. So the advantage of doing an entity and starting a business is you now loaning personal money that you've already paid taxes on to the entity. The same way you just asked that question. Well, I'm a sole proprietorship. Well, you file a Schedule C, it subtracts from your personal income. Any other personal income, it subtracts from that. Okay. But is there any way to make that work? I mean, so, for example, we built a barn this year, fairly large expense. It's on the same piece of property as our personal home. So the property and the barn are owned by my wife and myself as individuals. Um, it doesn't seem like there'd be any way to say that that we're loaning money to the LLC because the the piece of property that the building is on is owned by us as individuals. That's, the, that's why I use that example. Once you form the LLC, a separate area of yourself, now you now can loan the entity. But here's a vision now. Wait a minute. You said you're a sole proprietorship, correct? You said that you and your wife own the land personally, correct? That's fine. As a sole proprietorship now, the only thing you can deduct is you can still deduct the expenses to the barn on a schedule F now. I say a schedule F. I say C now. I forgot you. We're talking about farm here now. On a schedule F, you can utilize all the cost of construction. You can do all the things. You, but now, if you built the building, normally they say anything over ten thousand dollars, they want you to depreciate that building. But you can still deduct all the costs and everything associated with it. To take it a step further. You and your wife bought the, uh, own the land. You and your wife own the building. Once you form an entity, you and your wife now can rent the building to the entity. Ah, I got it. I like that. Okay. Now, let me give you another way. What people do. You built a building on a piece of land that you own. A lot of people sometimes try to separate the deeds or they put a, a lease agreement in place if you're going to use their building for, purpose, for business or public purposes, that now you're leasing the land to the building. You create separation there. Okay? But again, now, if you and your wife own the property and the building, just create an entity, or it could be a sober property. It'll be perfect. You can be a sober property. That now you're leasing the land, but if you create an entity, that's clear separation. You're leasing the building to the entity. But the entity, that's clear separation. Now, you can still lease it to you and your wife now, but you're still together like this. That makes sense? Yep, yep, that makes sense, thanks. You want to create an entity to separate you two. You see what I'm saying? I don't know if you can see my illustrations by hand here. You want to create an entity 
as a sole, as a scared C, you're just like this. But as an entity, LLC tax as a corporation, now you became like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. Now back to partnership. Easy to organize. Better financial strength. Combined skills and judgment are one or more persons. Has legal status now. It is a Schedule C. I think I got one more question that gave me. Does it hurt the farm if if workers claim unemployment when the season is slow? Um, the answer is yes, but it don't hurt to fake the point that you think I would say. What I mean by that, anytime individuals apply for unemployment, it increases your unemployment rate the following year. Because see what happens, everybody got an account. But once you deplete that account now, then you got to replenish it. So what the, what the state normally does is increase your employment rate so you can replenish those people account. You only pay a percentage of what your total payroll is on each quarter, okay? Will the farm need to track what workers are seasonal? Yes. Because you need to list them as seasonal workers. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit on that. Sometimes seasonal workers in certain states, or maybe you have different exclusion because they're seasonal workers. Okay. So, do you want to list them as seasonal workers? Absolutely. We have clients who utilize H2A workers. Okay. So, we, we do always use them as seasonal. But when you apply for your withholding numbers, you need to check that you have seasonal employees, okay? All right? You need to check that they have seasonal employees. But remember now, your workers are what? Agriculture employees now. You're not, these are these, these men and women, women are agriculture employees. So you make sure you list them as agriculture employees now. There are tax benefits and tax breaks on agriculture employees because the withholding rates normally is lower on agriculture employees. That's why you do not, repeat this, you do not fill out a form 941 for employment records on agriculture employees. You only fill out a form 943, okay? All right? All right. Keep the questions coming, okay? And you can stop anytime, all right? Now, the disadvantage to a limited li liability, uh, unlimited liability is, is a disadvantage for a general partnership. It's just like a sole partnership with two or more people, okay? Now, this is where partnerships come in. A lot of people come and say, me and my brother, me and my sister, we want to form a company or we want to form a business and we want to be partners. Everyone say, I'm going to do a general partnership. But a general partnership is just like a sole partnership, just two separate people, okay? But it is, again now, it does file a form T65 tax file form, okay? But now, if you do that, this is the only way, you, this is the way you should go, with, okay? We're going to move forward, okay? Now, now, on a, I'm a, I'm a what, it, what, what it is, a, what is a corporation? We're going to talk about the next slide. We're going to talk about the 1065 for a partnership, okay? And with a partnership, just like a K-1 form, um, just like a partnership, just like a corporation, you're going to get what they call a K-1 form, okay? I'm going to go back to this form. If you file a general partnership, this is how you file a general partnership okay on a 1065 um, form okay all right now on a 10 on a general partnership just like a corporation you're gonna get a k1 form here's how when we talk about the LLCs and S corporate structures here's the one thing that you got that you're going to receive you're going to receive a k1 form this is a plus and minus of your business okay if your business made ten thousand dollars you put it on a k1 form Put in your personal. If your business lost ten thousand dollars, you put it'll be a native um, or net business expense. You put it on your personal. Okay, and we're gonna talk about it more as we get into the later on down the road. Okay, but the one thing about the K one form, the ten sixty five and the eleven twenty S, whether it be S or C, you cannot file your personal tax return without filing the K. If you get a K one form from a partnership or a corporation. You cannot file your personal tax return because this is how you put you report the income from a partnership and an S corporation is on your personal tax return, the K1 form. Henceforth, 
why corporate returns are due March 15th, personal returns are due April 15th. So you can get the K-1 form from the pass-throughs to put in your personal. That's why you have that difference in time frame. Of course, nonprofits are due um, May 15th, okay? But again, you cannot file a personal tax return without the kit before you file your pass through internet, whether it be a partnership or S corporation. Okay. All right. Now, what is okay? Now, if you, if, any questions? Any questions for anyone? Okay. Keep going. On. What is a corporation is a person or a group who establishes a legal entity by filing articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State? Secretary of State is granted certain legal powers, rights, privileges, and liabilities, okay? An S corporation is an eligible domestic corporation that wants to avoid double taxation, wants to shareholder and again to the corporation by electing the status of user 2553, election to be a small business. An S corporation is not a sole proprietorship or partnership. Okay, let me tell you what I just read. Okay, what it's saying here is then, when you go down to your local secretary of state and you want to form an organization of incorporation, you are now forming, you're telling the state of Virginia or whatever state you're in that I'm forming a corporation in this state, okay? Now, when you file a articles of organization, you told the, uh, you go to the secretary of state and you told the secretary of state that I'm, I'm filing organ, uh, articles of organization, which is an LLC in, in that state. If you file an article of incorporation or articles of organization in the state of Virginia or, all you, or any prospective state, you just told the states you're into this structure. You have not told the IRS one single thing. The IRS don't know you exist. Because this is a state filing, not a state and federal filing. But when you see this part here say by electing the status of using a 2553, here's where you just told the IRS what you are, but guess what? No one's finished that second step. Okay. We can have a lot of problems with attorneys as well in that aspect because most people file the attorneys are filed, not necessarily not attorneys don't file all of it. But most times they only file the state filing fees, the state application. You've got to go to the state and tell the state I want to be an entity. But I'm going to repeat what I said now. Here's where people mess up an EIN number. They'll file an EIN number before they go to the state. So what I tell people all the time, if you're going to form an entity, get the state structure first, then file an EIN number. Sometimes with coming out of names, that name that you file in Virginia may not be available at the, at the federal state at, 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 with, with, the, with the IRS because somebody already got that name. Remember now, when you file a name, I can, I can go and put Durrell Tenant on uh, Farms in North Carolina. But if there's a Durrell Tenant Farms in Virginia, I can't get a EIN number because somebody already claimed Durrell Tenant Farms. Even though I can operate here in North Carolina, and they can operate the rare tenant farms in Virginia. But now, if the only way to stop that, you say, I'm going to do a national registration. But most people don't do that now. We're not the Walmarts, we're not the Targets, we're not the Googles or whatever. And we've had clients, had a client in the state of North Carolina, he opened a restaurant and he put grill and chill on it, on the internet restaurant. Well, about a month later, about two months later, he got a letter from Dairy Queen with a cease and desist because Dairy Queen has a national registration on, on grill and chill. So we tell people, if you want, if you plan on going global, then you need to make sure that name is available. Okay? So we've had that before where clients have open companies and put slogans that are of a similar to a national brand, they get a cease and desist letter. Because, but until you get to that level where you have attorneys all marked to those, these, these naming rights, this is where the problems you're running to, okay? So remember now, when you go to the Secretary of State and file your articles of organization, you just file a articles of incorporation, which is automatically a C corporation. Now, if you go to the Secretary of State 
and follow articles of the organization, that is a limited liability company. I'm correct. Article Incorporation is a corporation. Articles of organization is an LLC. But let me repeat this very clearly. A limited liability company is not a corporation. A limited liability company is an organization of a group of people. Okay? I'm going to say it again now. A limited liability company is not a corporation. It's an organization of a group of people. And we're going to explain that what's, why we say that an S corporation is not a sole proprietor or partnership. They can't be S corporation. Okay. All right. Now, here's where we get a problem here. Here's where the big boy come in. A limited liability company. A limited liability company has some characteristics of a partnership and some characteristics of a corporation. A LLC may be organized to avoid double taxation. We're going to explain all that to you with frequent accompanies of the S corporation. The owners of LLCs are members and managers. LLCs are managed by members or managers who may or may not be members. What they're saying, if we form an LLC and me and Mr. Book says, we're going to form an LLC together. And Mr. Book says, you know what, Darrell, I don't trust you. We're going to have a member-managed LLC. So now we both are going to be member-managed. So we just became a member-managed LLC. Now, we go out here and say, me and Mr. Book from the LLC. And we say, you know what, Darrell? I say, I say, you know what, Mr. Book? I think you know way more than me. I'm going to make you the manager. So now you just have a managed-managed LLC. That's the difference in a member-managed LLC and a management LLC. You signify a manager. But here's the thing. If me and Mr. Book go and say, we're going to form an LLC, but well, we're going to hire Ms. Barlow because we know she's smart and looks smart than either one of us. Now we make her the manager. Now it's still a managed manager LLC, but she don't have to be a member. We hire her to be a manager. That's the difference in member managed LLCs and managed, man, 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 member managed LLCs and managed managed LLCs. You name a manager, okay? But if everybody at the table say, nope, I, we all going to make decisions, guess what? You know, we're a member of the LLC, okay? The states of a member of the LLC are managers, members in general limit liability. But remember now, as a member of the LLC, don't want that thin line, know what each member is doing now. Now, I'm in North Carolina, you're in Virginia. If I come back to North Carolina and say, look, hey, I don't know what they be doing up in Virginia, I'm fine because I'm a member. But the purpose of the LLCs was, remember when Adolphus and all this corporation entered on, when we had, when Skilling uh, said that Ken Lane knew everything was going on, and Lane said, I didn't know nothing was going on. That way, our current step didn't create a limited liability companies. Because as a corporation, officers, the president can't say the vice president know what he's doing. The vice president can't say the officer know what he's doing. That's why, see, articles of organization have officers. You all are liable. A limited liability company have members, and you can say, I don't know what the other member was doing. That's where LLCs came in at, because every politician is a businessman or lawyer, but they come up and say, hey, good, guess what? If I run a corporation, I'm not there, I'm, I can be a member of the organization. So that's where that came in at from member managed LLCs. That's where LLCs came from, okay? Because the LLCs do not technically have officers. It has members and managers, okay? That's the purpose of LLC. Okay, now, here is where the problem comes with limited liability companies. LLCs can choose to file as a sole partnership, partnership, or to be taxed as a corporation. You remember that the other slide previously said it has some characteristics and avoid the double taxation? Here's, I'm going to explain how, wh why so many people are in trouble with LLCs. Because the LLC can, can, an LLC can elect to be treated as an S corporation. Uh, S corporation restriction on the number of owners does not apply. Can it be owned by a corporation? Can it be treated as a partnership for federal tax purposes if two or more owners? Earnings may be subject to self-employment tax because if you are a sole proprietorship, uh, you got self-employment tax. Life of the LLC is limited. You can start and stop an LLC at any time. Most C corporations or incorporations are perpetual forever. But an LLC, you can limit the time on an LLC. 
Okay, now the problem is when you form that name and liability company, when you tell the Secretary of State that I want to all this organization, you form an LLC. But now you got to tell the IRS how I want to be taxed. That's what proud people get in problems with. They don't understand that you have to tell the IRS how I want my LLC to be recognized. People come to the other time, I say, how do you recognize? I'm an LLC, how do you recognize? One day they say, you know what the LLC is, because you know how, what that means, as I explain her. Once you form an organization, Secretary of State, you got 75 days to file 25 days to tell the IRS, is that how you want to be recognized? If you do not file, if you file an EIN number on a single member LLC, you are a sole proprietorship. Another member LLC, you are a partnership. You have to elect to tell the IRS, I want to be taxed as an corporation to avoid double taxation. You say, no one ever told me that. Okay? What I'm saying is, when you form a limited liability company, you have three different ways to choose. When you form an articles of incorporation, you only got one. You are automatically C corporation, but you can let it be S corporate as we get into that. Okay. Remember, articles of organization, incorporation, you are a corporation and you are automatically a C corp. Where double taxation comes in at is if you are a C corporation, it's going to pay taxes. If you pay yourself payroll, it's going to pay taxes. But an S corporation does not pay taxes. That's a pass-through. It's paid through the shareholders. Okay? And repeat, an S corporation does not pay taxes. Okay? That's why most people choose S corporation, because it goes to the shareholders. And here's what I mean by that, okay? All right. When you become a limited liability company, when you form an organization, you got 75 days from the date of the incorporation or organization to file a 2553 to tell the IRS, I want my LLC to be taxed as a corporation. Here's what everyone missed. If you file an EIN number in your third paragraph, it tells you this in a timely manner to file a form of an election. No one reads that, that EI letters. Nobody reads those letters, okay? But here's what the letter is telling you. You got 75 days. It says timely manner, but 75 days is a call to get this 2553 into the IRS to tell them I want to be taxed as a corporation. Now, if you go out here and you start Darrell's Apple Farm, okay? And I go down and file an Arkansas organization. And I get my EIN number. And I check I'm a single member of LSC, as I said before. Guess what? I'm a sole proprietorship. Partnership, I'm a 1065. But I told the IRS I want to be a, a C corporation. But most people don't understand. The reason when you, if your intent is to be a corporation, you got to check corporation. Now you told the IRS I want to be taxed as a corporation. But you got to tell them which type. Here's where that 2553 comes in at, okay? Name, address, date of incorporation, and you're telling them that I want calendar year, but I want to be recognized as an S corporation. If you do not file this form within 75 days, you are going to be denied. Okay, let me repeat that. If you do not file this form within 75 days, you are going to be denied election of an S corporation. Unless... You write across the top of this form, filing pursuant rev proc, meaning filing pursuant revenue procedure. We put rev proc 2013-30. That's a late revenue filing procedure. You literally got to write that across the top of that paper, pencil, crown, blood, ink, filing pursuant rev proc 2013-30. Now, you said two years later, now you can get an S-corporate election, but you can only go back to the beginning of that preceding year. Now, here's what I mean by that. If you file an S-corporation in 2015, I can only go back to begin, if you haven't filed your returns yet, to 2019. If I say, okay, as of 2021, January 1st, I want to be recognized as S-corporation moving forward. But if I form an S-corporation, the, the day is November. I formed it in March 1st, 
I can only go back to March 1st to be recognized as an S corporation because I can't go back prior to the date that I, I was recognized. Okay? But I can go backwards up until the beginning of the preceding year to file the 2553. Okay? Again, once you file articles of incorporation, that is because you're automatically C Corp, you can make a C Corp tax as an S corporation. This is how. If you file an LLC, you have to choose which way you're going to file from the beginning, okay? But if you file a corporation, if you want to be a corporation, you check corporation, okay? Now, the second page is very, very crucial over 2553, okay? All right? This is who owns the S corporation, okay? This is who owns the S corporation. If I say I'm 100% owner, I'm 100% owner. You can have up to 100 members, <clears throat> okay? If you say I want my, I want to own 51%, and I want my children to own the other 49%, you can list them. That's that, that's pretty well. Remember, now, kids underage will be faced with kitty tax, what they call it, kitty tax, okay? But why the, the 2553 is very important? It's because a lot of things are going now. It shows who owns it, who has majority interest. If you're trying to claim any type of minority ownership, you're trying to claim a women-owned business, as long as you own 51%, this is how you do it, okay? But the next biggest advantage to a, uh, a the second page of a 25-53, it clearly states who owns, who owns what percentage, okay? Here's what we run into every year. We have this every year with family members, okay? You run into what they call the good child and the bad child, okay? And what I mean by that is every time we have family members come in here, that is no exactly what child they want to have. Mamas always say, I want all my babies to share equal. Here's what I mean by that. If you saying that I got too good, too bad, too good, they both get together, they can outvote the good. If you want someone to have control interest of your company, this is how you do it. If you want one person to have 75%, the other person to have 25%, this is how they, you do it. If you want one to have 51%, one to have 49%, this is how you do it. Here's how you show the ownership. But remember now, the person with the largest share has control of the interest unless two or more get together. Now remember now, the person who has the largest share has a controlling interest. Makes sense now. But don't go ahead and give yourself 30% and divide everybody else up the seven percent, and they come together. If they ever come together, they can outvote you. Okay, we get this question all the time. If I, we get it's happening all the time, I'm retired. I I can't make but so much money. I'm on disability. My husband, my wife, I can't make but so much money. The problem is the purpose of an S corporation filing twenty five fifty three is because once you form a separate entity. This LSC, tax as an S corporation, can make a million dollars. You haven't made one dime yet. Because the entity made the money, not you. If you're a military retiree, you're on disability, whatever, you can only make so much money. So guess what? Then pay yourself the only your limited amount from the corporation. Let the corporation make a million dollars, but you only pay yourself 25000 so now, if you're sole proprietorship, you just lost your retirement, lost your disability. Now, Social Security is saying you made too much money because you got it. You are a sole proprietorship. You are making the money. The entity need to make the money. So when you retire, you have no no confliction with your retirement. But remember now, you're going to get a K one form. Here's where again we get this question all the time. Husband and wife, should we put 50-50? My answer is this. I would say no. But if you love each other, you know you ain't going nowhere as cheap as keeping, give it to one individual and let them hold liable. Give them 100%. Because if you marry father jointly and marry the asset, you're still liable. But if you own... 100% and something happens, it does not affect the spouse. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're going to be together. Then you might divide that 50-50 whatever percentage you want. Then that will determine how who holds it. So I tell people all the time, my suggestion is husband and wife should not go 50-50, not saying they can have percentage ownership, but we have a lot of times where they say, well, I'm trying to qualify for some type of minor program or some type of women's own program or some type of program that that's so, so if you want to get one person 51 percent and you take 40 percent that's fine but here on this second page is here how you determine how s corporations and llc's and ic's work are there any questions about that okay here again is where the most problems coming out from s corporations okay all right now now, I don't know if we want to take a break or if we want to take a break, we want to continue. Let's take a break for a few minutes. Okay. All right. And then we'll get into the report card, okay? All right. All right. All right. Let's let me know when we get ready to start back.
I think we might be ready to start, Daryl. Thank you for your work so far. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I think we got it fixed now. I want to make sure that it's advancing now. Correct. Uh, and make sure we got. It. Yeah, is it advanced for everyone? Yeah. Yes. Okay, we got it fixed. I apologize. We had a. I had a <laughs> hooked up the wrong cable hooked into the computer. Okay. All right. That's much better. Okay, here we go. Uh, if everybody ready to get started? I think we got a, a question. Um, let me go back to where we're at. I think we got a question from Ms. From Ms. Marjorie. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. can, can, okay. So the question is, uh, we just started an LLC this month. And we got the EIN number, but we didn't do the classification that you're talking about yes. with the 2553. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we do that? How do we correct it? Okay, one thing we got to do is once we file, I'm gonna go back to that form. Once we file the 2553, okay? So anyone know, okay? When we work with, when we fix for our client, you see on this form, it says name and instruction, okay? Employee identification number. Do you have your EIN number? Do you yes, have sir. Okay. Now, the reason I ask that question, I want everyone to understand, you do not need an EIN number to file an article or organization or incorporate with the Secretary of State. A lot of people make that mistake. They say, oh, I thought I have to have. The Secretary of State don't ask no EIN number. They don't even want nothing but an EIN number. Because remember, when you're filing the articles of organization or incorporation, you are only filing with the state that you're in. Okay, and that's not federal yet. So that's why I asked that question. So you, you have your EIA number, name, address, date of incorporation, city, state, state of incorporation. See, these are things that you have to have. You have to have the, the EIA number, the date that you incorporated, and the state that you incorporate in, okay? Now, it's going to ask you on line E. Can everybody see that section on line E? 
Yes. Elation is being fed in the tax you're beginning. See and start. When do you want this to begin? That's where you say, I want to start March 1st. I want to start August 27th. But most people are like, if you've already formed it, and my advice to you, is because we're at the end of the year, I can go back to January 1st if you went beyond January 1st of this year. But if you say you just formed it, say, October 1st, I can only go back to October 1st. But as I tell people, if you file your, yeah, your LLC or INC three years ago, and we November, I would say, let's start January 1st of 2021. Now, I can go back to January 1st of 2020, but the problem is you operate so long as a, as a sole proprietorship, it may be our advantage to start in January 1st, finish this year out, file like you normally file, because sometimes you have to wait for the election to be recognized before you can file. Or I will file the 2553 and lay it on a tax return and mail the tax return in with the 2553. Okay? So we can go back and fix it. What month did you begin your LLC? November 1. 2020. Okay. Well, if you know them one, you still in good time. You don't have to use your rare file. You can file it anytime. You got 75 days now to file this form. Okay. And we, we're going to get your information file with you. We can, we, we can assist you getting that done. Okay. All right. If you file it November 1st, you still. So, so, so we do. So do yeah. we go back? Is there a way to edit the EIN number? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No. See, what happened is, even if you check sole proprietorship, even if you check um, partnership, when you f when you put that EIA number on, on, on line A, section A, and you ask it to be recognized, they are going to change that EIA number filing requirements. See, right now, do you know what your filing requirement is for your EIA number? Did you check sole proprietorship? Did you check partnership? Do you know? Uh, LLC. I think we put LLC. If you did, if you put LLC, you're a I sole proprietorship. To... Nope. If you put a single member LLC, you are a sole proprietorship. Remember I said, if you put multi-member LLC, yes. you automatically a partnership. You just told the IRS. But your intention, Ms. Marjorie, was you wanted you and your family to be separate from your company, right? Yes, sir. If that was your intention, you see where on, on, on the EIN number, you should have checked corporation. Okay? Because your intentions are, and I, I hate to say it, the IRS, I think, think people already know this. If your intentions are to separate yourself, check corporation. This form you're looking at, you got 75 days to fill it out. Most people don't know that. Okay? That's where the problem comes in at. Because here's what's going to happen. So, what? So what's the form? Are you about to tell us what's the form that we fill out within yes. 75 days? Do you see the 2553 on your screen? Do y'all see that form? Yes. That's the form right here. That's just the form right here. Yes, sir. I want to make sure everybody see it. Everybody see that 2553? Yeah. This is the form that you fill out to let your LLC or INC to be taxed as a corporation. Okay? Now, and see again now, if you get March 1st, you put November 1st on it on E, but state, state of the corporation on C, V, A, D, B is date November 1st. Whenever that is on your stamp of your article, you put November 1st. And of course, you put your EIN number. Okay? Now, let me, let me repeat that. If you don't have an EIN number, sometimes they will assign you one. Okay? All right? All right? That's the form. Now, Ms. Marjorie, remember, page two is who owns it. Now, remember now, if you own 50%, your husband owns 50%. You're going to get a K-1 form, he's going to get a K-1 form. If you own 50%, one child on 25%, the other child on 25%, all three of you are going to get a K-1 form. 
Okay. Look at the, you got to file on your tax return. Okay. Each child got to file on their tax return. Okay. So whoever you put on here, the IRS is looking for a K-1 form on your personal tax return. Because when you put your name, address, which you can use same address, doesn't matter, signature date, number of shares of ownership or percentage of ownership. So one person on one percent, when he or she file their tax return, when they file their personal tax return, they're going to get a nice and nice for IRS saying, we're looking for a K-1 form because you got one percent ownership in another company. And you're going to be that with verbatim now. But you're going to get a letter from the IRS looking for that K-1 form. Okay? All right. So you got it? All right. Now, this is it. Now, what I was talking about S Corporation. S Corporation has all aspects except the corporation entity pays no income tax because each shareholder's own owner reports his or her share of the corporation income tax for income tax purposes on the individual tax return. A S Corporation must have at least one shareholder, no more than 100, okay? As I'm saying in this Marjorie and others, you cannot file your personal tax return without filing the K-1 form. That's why you file corporate returns first and personal returns second, okay? Double taxation is avoided on an S corporation. As I stated earlier, a C corp gonna pay if if, if that company made five dollars, it's gonna pay taxes. If you pay a separate company, you're gonna pay payroll taxes. But as corporation doesn't pay taxes, it pays it through the shareholders. Now here's another advantage. Okay, you own um, you are you're paying yourself for this company, you own this company, and you paid yourself thirty thousand dollars for this company. Now the thirty thousand dollars is a tax deduction to the company. But now, if you paid yourself thirty thousand and this company loses ten thousand, guess what? Your tax income now is only twenty. You separate the corporate because you own this company, and you take the K one form. But if you got a negative ten thousand dollars and you and you and you paid yourself thirty thousand, it's going to reduce that to twenty thousand dollars. It offset personal income now. If you work on another job, as I said earlier, and you work on another job, and you own this company, and you make thirty thousand dollars on that job, this company lost ten thousand. Guess what? Your job now income is going to be taxable at twenty thousand dollars. It's going to reduce offset personal income. Okay. Now, I gave an example earlier uh, about the two companies, about the Apple company and the Apple Farm. Okay. For example, say if you got two companies, right? The Pie company is booming. You know, um, everybody's at home now because of COVID 19, and all everybody do is eating apple pie. All right. It didn't show a profit of $50,000. It's booming. But guess what? The farm, even though it's growing for apples, it may, it may be struggling with cost of operation, yada, yada, yada. The, the, the pie company made $50,000, but the apple company lost $50,000. Guess what? There's no taxes paid. It evens out. The pie company made fifty thousand. The apple company lost sixty thousand. There's no tax to pay because the apple company wiped the pie company profits out. The pie company made fifty thousand, but the apple company lost ten thousand. Well, the pie company now is on tax at forty thousand. So one, a lot of time, entities offset each other. One entity make money, the other, other entity lose money. Money. You got a room, You got a company. That's what you rent. You rent your land to. It lost ten thousand dollars, taxes, maintenance, whatever. The company it made twenty thousand, but guess what? Its tax income is only ten thousand dollars because one entity offsets another entity. All right, that's a that's another advantage why people structure separate entities because again, like I said, each entity has its own expenses it can file and it can help offset each other. Okay, all right. Uh, same uh, living as a C corp, pass through of uh, profits not subject to seven property tax. Remember now, if you are a sole proprietor, you are subject to seven property tax. S corp is not. This event, um, French business are restricted. Shows pay tax on undistributed income. Now, 
The first one, this is an always say friend. The second one is crucial. Shareholders pay taxes on undistributed income. Here's what it's saying. If your company made $30,000, you will get a nice K-1 form for $30,000 for putting a personal tax return, okay? But here's what you should have done. You start seeing your company making money, increase your payroll. They always say in the S Corporation, IRS wants you to have a reasonable wages. Increase your payroll. Remember, in the S Corporation, your payroll is the deduction to the company. So if instead of having $30,000 set in it as profit, increase your payroll. Because now you are reducing that $30,000 profit, but you're paying taxes on the company. The company has a tax deduction, but you, the individual, is your payroll is increasing, so your wages are increasing to better qualify you. So you came from making $30,000, now to $60,000. But again now, because you pay yourself from the company, you don't pay double taxation because the company doesn't pay taxes. That's the biggest mistake a lot of people make. People come in all the time and say, I'm making so much money, I'm paying estimated taxes. No. If you get to the point that you got to pay estimated taxes, you're saying, I'm going to have this big profit in a year, I'm going to pay my taxes, put yourself on the payroll. Payroll taxes is your taxes. And any money you make that you pay tax on, you can do anything you want to do with it. You can throw it out the window, you can set a fire to it because you've already paid tax on it. So now here where I pay myself $60,000, I've already paid tax on this money. Oh, guess what? Because I've already paid tax on this money, I can loan it to my pie company. And now I can start my pie company. But oh, by the way, because I've already paid tax on that money, I don't pay taxes on what I loan. Now that company owes my money back because I already paid tax on it to payroll. Okay, so that's the advantage of a lot of times why you want to pay yourself from your company. Okay, let's flex for choosing a tax year. Okay, and number of shareholders are limited to one hundred. Okay, now this is an S corporation. This is the advantages of S corporation. A lot of our farmers now, a lot of our agriculturalists, men and women now, agribusiness men and women now, are understanding and utilizing a seeing the value of having a separate entity, okay? Entities are very important, okay? You understand the value of having an entity, okay? All right? Now, we're going to talk about 1120S. Here is where you, where you file a S corporation on your 1120S, okay? Income and expenses. You see on this 1120S, it has gross receipts on line 1A, correct? Now, the reason I, I bring this up, I told you, in agriculture, you always file a Schedule F. And in this situation, true, is still true. When you form an S corporation on your farm or any type of agriculture operation, you still file a Schedule F and attach it to 1120S. You do not put income expenses on this form. Let me repeat that. I said, file a corporation, absolutely. I said the only form you use is Schedule F. That's still true. Because you got 1120S filing requirement, you attach the Schedule F to this form. Okay, a lot of people made a mistake and said, well, I'm a corporation, I've had concept, I'm a corporation, so I don't do a Schedule F. Wrong. If you're a farm, you do Schedule F. If you're an ordinary corporation, you do 1120S. But you do not put income expenses on this form. You put it on a Schedule F and attach it to this form, okay? All right, now that's 1120S, okay? Now again, here, here again, you cannot file your personal tax return without the K-1 form. You cannot file a personal tax return without the K-1 form. Okay? All right? Now, we're talking about C corporation. Okay? That is a standalone. A C corporation is a separate business entity distinct of its owners. That's why we call it a standalone. Okay? 
who are called shareholders because they own shares and interests of the corporation. They own shares. When you file a C-Corp, how many shares are you own? In most states, one person can own one share of all the corporation, okay? A major characteristic of this corporation forms a business organization is a sharp line of distinction between the business and its owners. Straight down simple. An S corporation is a pass-through. It passes through to the owner. A C corporation, totally separate. Here's, here's a C, here's you, totally separate. But a C corporation cannot help you personally. It doesn't offset any income, okay? A C corporation pays double taxation. The biggest disadvantage here, double taxation. Profit are taxed at the corporate level of a dividend distribution and the shareholders are taxed at the individual level, okay? Life is perpetual, it's advantage, it's forever. Stockholders have limited liability. Transfer of ownership um, is easy through sales of stock. Okay, I'm gonna sell stock from other from for my um, 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 C corp. Okay, difficult expense to organize. We get that a lot. We keep that on it because people say, "I heard it say no, it's not." It's the same thing. You just follow two different forms. I put that so I can instruct people. It's the same thing as following a uh, LLC organization. Same exact thing. Corporate charge may restrict types of business activities. You can have corporate charters that say you can and can't do this, you can and can't do that, okay? So that's the, the disadvantage of C-Corporation, okay? Now, 1120 is where you file a C-Corporation at, okay? It's 1120. And remember now, the S-Corporation was 1120S. This is a C-Corporation, which is 1120, okay? All right. In-home office now. A lot of these rules have changed now for the in-home office, okay? All right. But one thing about the business office, to qualify for deduction, the area of a home used for business must be regularly used and exclusively used, excuse me, for in-home office, okay? The principal place of business, including administrative use, is whatever you use in your home. And the reason we um, still keep these in here, these, these in-home in -home office rules changed last year. We do feel that every, every uh, election cycle, everything changed back again. So this may be something that may be changing back. I don't know, we don't know, but these are some of the things that changes um, through every election cycle, how tax rules may change. So again, we still keep this in our presentation because it's still a part of it, but a lot of the cities have changed um, last year, okay? A place to meet clients regularly, connects with the business, is separate structure, not attached to the taxpayers and personal residence. We do this all the time. If I'm running a, a light wire from my house to my home, is that connected? Yes, okay, that's still connected. But now, um, a connection with the business, if it's a separate structure, not attached to a tax personal resident. You can run utilities to it, but it's still a separate structure, okay? Uh, can be considered as an in -home office. Shareholders are allowed to dispense for business in their home as soon as shareholder receives reasonable wages. Um, such expenses re, uh, are deductible as employees' business expenses on schedule. If form 1040 is subject to 2% AGI limitation. What I'm saying here is that once you form an uh, in home office, it's subject, I mean, you can use an in home office, but you still got to pay yourself reasonable wages for it to be a beneficial to you. Okay? Now, these are some of the things in the in home office that you're going to do home office interest, real estate taxes, utilities, insurance. Rent. A lot of people don't know now. I rent a home. I can still claim part of my rent as my in home office, okay? Any repairs to the portion of the office portion of the house. If you have a house, you have an office, 100 square feet, you paint it. That's deductible. You fix the roof over there, that part is deductible. Okay, any portion of your home that you do deduction, okay? All right. 8829. Here's the form you use for in expense for in-home office use, okay? Of course, you got part one and you got part two, income and expenses, in-home office. People tell me all the time, uh, here's like, well, I'm scared to claim it because they say that you could get audit with an in-home office. I say, if you spent the money and you, le you legally, legitimately utilize those expenditures, why not put it down, okay? When it comes down to audits, if you can't justify what you put on there, then I'll advise you not to put it on there, okay? So, but if you 
legitimately utilizing your kitchen or your bedroom. And literally, it doesn't have to be a room with a desk, lab, computer, fireplace, and a fan. It can be your kitchen table. It can be your bedroom. Most parents, once children go off to college, kids come at home, their rooms convert to office because they're like, you gone. We use bedrooms a lot. So again, you do not, and we've had people think and thought, I have people say, well, I didn't use my, I didn't keep my receipt in the office because I thought I had to build another office. No, you don't. As I said, it could be your kitchen table. But as long as you keep the square footage of that kitchen or that area, and anything that you purchase for that portion is tax deductible, okay? And that's your in-home office, okay? Now, additional forms here that we want to go through is a 982, reduction of tax attribute, 843, claims for refund, application for draw personal tax uh, federal lien, application certificate of the discharge, and employees annual federal tax return agriculture employees, okay? Now, a 982, okay, this is one form, especially in the agriculture community, that a lot of our farmers in the past and present have missed. Because of what this form says is reduction to, of indebtedness, okay? We have a lot of time people get charge-offs. That's called a 1099C, okay? Whether it be foreclosure, whether it be a credit card, whether it be in agriculture, a lot of Farmers can't pay for equipment. A lot of farmers get charge-offs, okay? And when I mean again, when I say charge-offs, that means we had a bill for $10,000, we couldn't pay it. Financial institutions, banks, a lot of agriculture operations, they're going to issue a 1099-C, okay? Now, when you get that 1099-C, then that's when you're supposed to report that income on your personal tax return, okay? Let me repeat that. You put a report of income on your personal tax return. It is taxable, okay, because it's a charge off. Unless you take that charge off and you put it on this form 982. See when it say section C, this was discharged due to form indebtedness. You check that box, put that amount in this form, it's gone. You don't pay tax on that because you asked for them to exclude this indebtedness, okay? Can you use it personally? Yeah, people have filed chapters 11, uh, people were into solvency, okay? Um, D, discharge to qualify real property, business property indebted, it's a business property, I went in debt with it, I'm asking for it to be discharged. Um, a residential indebtedness, a lot of people don't understand, you can use this form, we have people here have foreclosures and stuff, but this is one form especially in our agriculture communities, because a lot of farmers, a lot of equipment providers, a lot of funders, because of the struggles that farmers have, has issued them charge off. And a lot of farmers have went into agriculturalists, have went into financial uh, distress because of these charge offs and chargebacks. But if they had known that you could have put this on a form 982 and discharged that indebtedness, then you don't have to worry about that. That, that debt has been discharged. Many farmers, many agriculturists have paying taxes they don't owe because they didn't know how to discharge that debt. Okay? Can you go back and amend it? Absolutely. And we'll talk about it uh, uh, later, okay? Now, the next form is the 843, okay? This is claim of refunds and requests for abatement. Everything I just said, if anyone heard anything today, they say, you know what? I didn't do that last year. I didn't do that year before last. I didn't do that 10 years ago. I didn't do that five years ago. You can go back and amend your return. Okay? That's called amendment. All right? Now, if you're going to amend your return, you can get what's owed to you for three years. People ask me all the time, how far can I go back? You can first want to go back but you're only gonna get what's owed to you for three years, okay? Now, people say, well, should I go back further? If we have clients right now today, the day is 2020. If they have a tax liability in 2015, and they still own that tax liability from 2015, I can go back 
and amend 2015 to make it right. If they were paying an arrangement for two years, I can go back and get that money back up to two years. If they, if I reduce that tax liability and they owe a tax refund, I can't get it for that year. But it could offset these current years to allow them to get tax refunds or get a, re, a ref, or get their money back up for two years. Okay? And this is the purpose of the 843. It's not said to file an amendment, but you can ask for abatement or forgiveness on penalties and interest. And they're going to tell you now, we don't need to do interest. But if there's no penalties, there's no interest. This form here is for a claim or request for abatement. Okay? I didn't file my LLC. We get this all the time. When people go out and form these LLCs, they do not know that these LLCs are due on April 15th. They didn't know that. They don't know that these LLCs are due. Um, I mean, uh, that, that, that if you do not file your LLC taxes corporate on time, and you have five members, or you have five people on the 2553, each individual is going to get penalized. So this is where the 843 comes in at, okay? You're asking for abatement of penalties and interest. Okay, or abatement of penalties. Interest is only going to be on penalties if they have, okay? So a form 843 is abatement of penalties and interest, okay? Now, a form 1277, application for withdrawal of, of, of the file uh, tax lien. Once you get into the arrangement of people, a lot of agriculture have liens, a lot of agriculture have problems with, with liens. So here's how you ask for a withdrawal, okay? A form 14135 is an application for a property tax. A lot of people have property, and you're asking for it to be discharged um, from a lien. You ask for your property to be discharged, okay? Now, as we said earlier, a 943, okay? A 943 is where if you are employing your children, family members, or individuals, period, this is a form you fill out in reporting taxable payroll income or payroll expenses. Okay? Do not fill out a 941. You only file a 943. And repeat this now. A lot of our farmers go out and apply for 941. Well, guess what? When you apply, when you utilize that 941, you're paying a higher payroll tax rate. Okay? A 943 is filed annually. A 941 is filed quarterly. Okay? Let me repeat that. A 941 is filed annually. A 94, I mean quarterly. A 943 is filed annually. So many people are paying agriculture but putting it on the wrong form. It's not wrong to the IRS. But you're not getting the advantage of filing 943. And the IRS is going to treat those as ordinary workers. Here, this is an employee's annual federal tax return for agriculture workers. Okay, for agriculture workers. Okay, all right. Any questions so far? Okay, any questions? Now, I want to get into it. I want to, we want to go into I want to get into uh, points to remember now. Okay, know what type of business entity you are, and understand your requirements. Okay, now here's what I mean by that. A lot of people we talked about we talked about uh, as earlier we should talk about. A lot of people now are going through the process of the SBA programs. Okay, a lot of our farmers some some missed this opportunity, okay? But it's not. It's still available to farmers. So anyone farm who will not have applied for your SBA applications and stuff, still they're available. Now, what happens was when we went through, when we went through this, this stimulus program, and everybody knows that stimulus program is going to be coming more in the future now. It's still some more coming out. The problem is if you don't have the proper structure, you the individual are applying for those subsidy programs, okay? 
you the individual are going to be responsible for repayment, if any, on some of those subsidy programs. If you are an entity, as I tell many, many of my, our clients, you need to start looking, forming you a legal entity, whether it be an INC or LSC, our recommendation be LSC, Texas Corporation. Because when you are borrowing these funds, these SBA loan guarantees, when you are looking at all your state programs, you the individual, if you are a sole proprietorship, if you're applying, you are receiving this money. You're going to be liable to repay this money. You're going to be holding the debt on this money. But if you are an entity, the entity is going to be borrowing the money. The entity is going to hold the debt on the money. It's almost the same fact that if ABC Farms borrowed this, this money, ABC Farms runs a problem. Well, ABC Farms is the only money, not the individual. Not saying they won't have you know, some liabilities, different things like that. But ABC Farm owes the money. Now, if you the individual owe the money, you're going to be debt free. You, the money's going to fall on you. Okay, I, I got $100,000, I got $50,000. Now I got to pay this money back. Here's what the question asked earlier, doing Benny's ass. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you do in Benny's ass. Whoever name is on that application, that's who's going to owe the money. But if you're an entity, it owes the money, not you. Can I repeat that? If you're an entity, it owes the money, not you. If you are a sole proprietorship and you, you have any type of debt on you, you owe the money. You can't go nowhere. Because you owe this money. But if an entity owes owe this money, then you can, you can say Durell Farms today, but you can start Durell Farms 2 tomorrow. Because Durell Farms owe the money, not Durell. Durell Farms owe the money. So I'm going to start Durell Farm number 2 tomorrow. That entity doesn't have any debt. It don't owe anybody. Because the debt was on the rail farm one. But if I'm the rail and I'm operating as the entity, then I can't go nowhere. I'm always going to be burned with that debt. I can't dump it, start another one, move forward. Okay? That is a purpose and advantage of having a structured entity so that you, the individual, may not be one liable for all. The indebtedness, the entity is liable for the debt. It's not true. You don't go bankrupt. You bankrupt the entity. I'm going to say it again. You don't go bankrupt. An entity can go bankrupt. It went bankrupt, not you. But if you are not an entity, then you don't go bankrupt. The person, the individual, instead of the entity. Okay? Foundation of the business will determine your tax liability. You got to know the difference in a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an S corporation, or a C corporation. Here's where all this plays in. Who bought what? Okay. If you have a sole proprietorship, if you are a sole proprietorship, you're going to be liable for everything. If you're a partnership, one or more partners, then you 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 share the you share uh, um, the uh, um, the responsibility. Okay. Always have an accurate accountability of your day to day operation. Okay. Know exactly what your company is doing each and every day. You know what that farm is doing. Okay. One of the things that we supply all of our um, clients with is a. Um, Financial statements, we call it financial statements. I'm sure you can't see this, okay? But this financial statement, it has everything our farmers need, our, our clients need. It has your profit and loss statements, it has your balance sheet, it has your cash flow statements, it has your trial balance, and it has your general ledger. These are the five, these are the five tabs, like a back up this guy, Clever. These are five tabs that most lending institutions want and most banks, I mean, lending institutions and banks are looking for. But one thing about a profit and loss statement, it's telling you day by day, what your expenses are, okay, each category, okay? Well, the general ledger, 
The last form tells you everything from January 1st to December 31st, what you're doing at Spanish Yard. Your profit and loss statement gives you a snapshot of what you're doing month to month. Remember I said earlier, I said, well, if you keep saying in the year on your, your p &L statement that you are profiting 30000 this month, you profit more money next month, then here's what we need to recognize that you need to raise your income. Well, it, it clearly can be signified on your profit and loss statement, your p &L statement, okay? Most institutions, most banks, most lending institutions want your p &L statements, okay? The p &L statement is going to be crucial on your daily activities, okay? And going back a little bit, when, you, when, we, when people talk about garnishments, and, 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 uh, and I'm sure people say, well, I, I've, I've got garnish from the IRS. Well, the reason that you got garnish from the IRS was because they want you to call them. People don't understand. The, the, guy, the IRS garnishes you to get a phone call. They say, okay, you won't call me from a letter, but if I garnish you, then you call me then. A lot of people come to us all the time saying, and this is a part of having that day-to-day -day accountability, because when you make a payment arrangement with IRS, and especially business, the first thing they're going to want to know, they want, your, they want, they want to know what your profit and loss statement are. They want, the first thing they're going to ask for two things, your bank statement or your P&L. Okay? Now, when they see that you may not can afford these payments, you possibly could go in uncollectible. Okay? That means you don't have to put everything in your mom's name. You can still go out here and conduct business as normal. And the R is giving you a chance to get yourself situated. Okay? That's why they garnish you. That's why when I say always have an accurate accountability or daily operation, because if you have these financial statements, they're going to base your repayment ability on the financial statement. We just had a client that had a debt of like $3,000 per month. It's because they're saying, you didn't tell us what your expenses are. You didn't show us what you're truly making. All they see is your income. See, you have to, it's, you got to tell the IRS, the IRS what you made, but it's up to you to tell them how you spent it. Okay? A lot of people come to me all the time and say, well, I got this 1099, but I don't want to report it because I don't want to add to my income. I say, well, if you've already got it in your hand, I'm sure the already got it. So you need to report it. But again, now, people come to me all the time and say, uh, I don't want to make any more money because the more money I'm making, the more tax I'm paying. The reason you're paying more tax is because you didn't tell IRS how much, how much you spent. You got to spend money to make money. You got to buy a bull to sell a bull. Okay, that's why we got that schedule every time mine. If I bought a bull and I sold a bull, I made money. But I still got to go back and say, how much did I spend for the bull? If you're growing products on your farm, you got to have chemicals. You got to have transportation. You got to have fertilizer. You got to have seeds, plants. You got to have all these legal tax deductions. Even if you go to a training, that the mileage, that's tax deductible. Many people today, as we are seeing now, you cannot find a computer in the stores. Reason being because they're using for Zoom in their business for training. Guess what? Your computer that you're looking, listening to this conference on is tax deductible. Your computer is tax deductible now. Guess what? You got to have the internet. That's tax deductible. This is all part of training. Okay? All the all your utilization now is tax deductible. That's why a lot of the rules are going to change this year because everybody will home. That's why I kept the in-home office in there because they're already stating there's going to be a lot of this section 139. There's going to be a lot of new changes this year. But keeping these expenditures as we today are learning. All this learning are resources, computers, the ink you're writing on, the pencils you're using, the paper you're using, all this that is tax deductible. This mouse that I have here that you have, tax deductible. Anything that you purchase from your business is tax deductible. Now, even if you file a Schedule C, it's still a tax deductible expense to you on a Schedule C. Okay? So please, if you bought a computer this year to Zoom, please, it's a tax deduction. If you bought paper, pens, anything, it's tax deductible. 
glasses, wherever, tax deductible, okay? All daily expenditures may have tax implication, reduction of taxable income, okay? What I'm saying here is simple, okay? I, I see some down there. What I'm saying here is always know what your daily expenditures may have tax implications are. Many people come to me, as I said previously, say, I don't want to make any more money because the more money I make, the more tax I pay. That's not true. The more money you make, the more expenses you have. The more money you make, the more money you spend. So if you're making more money, that means you're spending money. But if you're making money, but you're not taking time to understand the money you're spending, then you're right. You're paying taxes on money, on, on taxes on you do not owe. I repeat that now. The more money you make, the more expenses you incur. The more money you make, the more money you spend. So please keep a very accurate record of what your expenses are. People come to me all the time and say, what type of system should I use? Okay. And I tell them the same thing. Something you understand. Don't go out here and get the latest version of QuickBooks iCloud 8.0 if you don't understand it. Two plus two is four. You get something that's simply going to tell you two plus two is four. We get this all the time now. People go out and get these most elaborate accounting softwares that they can't even get it set up right. They can't even understand where it depreciates. They don't understand the reports that's being thrown at them. They say, I'm, I'm going to put this in. And remember now, whatever you put in, what's going to give you back? So I tell clients all the time, we get calls all the time. Can you show, show me how to do this? Can you figure out how to do it? No. If you do not understand the elaborate version, as I don't, get the simple version, as I do, that tells me 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay? So that's a, that's the basic thing is understanding. People are afraid to make money, and people, I have so many people coming in and stating that I'm, I'm going to give up. I'm not going to do it anymore because I'm paying all these taxes. So once we go back through, do some amendments, do, do analysis, review everything you've done, and the first question I ask you, where are the expenses from this year, this year, that year? I don't have them. I don't know it. I don't know what my expenses are. You only pay taxes on what that's for. And that's why I use a, this, this system of garnishments, okay? People avoid con contract hours that run in tax debt because they're afraid. Well, they don't want to close you down because they say, I can't get my money. If I close your business down, how am I going to get my money? All I want to know is, how are you going to pay me? And once you go into a financial arrangement with the IRS, once you go into those arrangements, you are in compliance. I'm going to repeat that now. Once you go into an arrangement, you are in compliance. You're good to go. As long as you're making those monthly payments, like you said, you're good to go. But if you ever, ever run into a situation where you can make the monthly payments, you have a reduction in your job, you lost your job, you had some type of unforeseen circumstance, pick up the phone and call them. Tell them your circumstances. Tell them you have a reduction in pay. Tell them you lost your job. And again, your monthly payments will be drastically lowered, or they'll say, we see at this time you can't afford to pay those taxes, so we're going to make you uncollectible. Okay, we're going to make you uncollectible. Don't run, don't hide. You've got an arrangement, you're in uncollectible. You can go ahead and make all the money you want to make. But now, each year now, when it's time to file tax again, they say, Oh, now we see you made some more money. Possibly now you can start with a, another payment arrangement. They're not going to come and say, You know, all my money right now, go back and do another payment arrangement. Okay, be having an arrangement is very crucial. But I want to touch bases, as I was saying earlier, on the COVID-19 issues, okay? Um, and the importance of business structure development. Please, anyone who is a sole proprietor, and I'm not saying you have to be an entity, I would advise you to be an entity if you want to grow your business and understand your business. Sole proprietorship doesn't hurt a person who say, look, I'm growing cucumbers in the yard, I just want to have a little something, I, I sell them at the farmer's market, whatever. I'm if you say
support coming out for small businesses and agricultural businesses, okay? Um, and the first time the COVID came out, they left our agriculture, but then it came back and put agriculture in it. So what I'm saying to you very clearly is, now is the time for individuals to start looking at opportunities of creating entities, okay? Because these entities now, there's a lot of programs we, we know of and we're part of and we see a lot of programs that stated coming out supporting your growth and agriculture is included. We was a part of a state program of recovery programs, retooling programs, what they call it here. We got a lot of state assistance programs, a lot of different programs that's coming to help business owners to get back on their feet, to help business owners grow. Agribusiness women, agribusiness men and women are included. But the point I'm trying to say to you is now's the time to structure entity so the entity can start capitalizing on these programs. Okay. You, the individual, some are going to be grants, some are going to be loans. You know, I tell people all the time, people, the question we get all the time is the grant portions are gone. Okay, that was the $10,000, which a lot of people didn't understand how that worked, a thousand dollars per employee. But the, not saying it's not coming back because there's some grant programs here in our state that just got released. And all a lot of states are releasing state supported grant programs. But the point I'm trying to say is that if you have to take loans on certain instances, there are a lot of these programs like the SBA, 30 years, 3.75%, it's not going to happen again. But I tell people all the time if you don't want the funds, if you don't need the funds, I still rather would take the funds, place them in the bank, in my own entity, and if you don't want it, give it back to them. But the problem is, what's going to happen if they can forgive it? Okay? If they forgive it. A lot of these programs with the PPP programs, $50,000 or less, has already been forgiven. Okay? I cannot say what program is going to be forgiven. I won't say what program, I can't say what program is forgiven, but I tell people all the time, if you have the resources, if they, if you take the resources, if you don't need it, give it back. But if you have, if you take the resources and if you give it, if you don't have it, you won't have nothing to be forgiven on. Okay? Because some, and a lot of these programs are going to be forgiven. Okay? I can't say which ones are now. But even with the PPP, I use an example. They've already forgiven automatically, automatically. Anything less than fifty thousand dollars, automatically forgiven. Okay, all right, all right. Now, um, any questions? Are there any questions? Hmm. I do. I have a question. How do you find out where all the loans and grants are that are available? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Um, there, there are a lot of uh, resources. I, I would contact one of the, the, the best resources is your local, your state CDIF offices. Okay. Like we have Carolina Small Business here, we have the, the North Carolina Institute, um, we have um, the Carolina Way, Mecklenburg Program. Now, CIF is a community development. Uh, uh, if I'm saying it right, community development, community development investment funds. Okay, um, and we have some that that, that are statewide, various uh, uh, multi-state. Okay, because I know one of the ones we work on with the North Carolina Recovery. I think they have portions of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and then you have a various institution. But a lot of it, I'll be honest with you, on the, on the SBA website, you can Google resources. Okay, I would tell people to join the SBA um, 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 programs where they can see the emails. But well, one good resource is to tap into your state CDIF offices. Okay, your state CDIF offices. Okay, like I said, I won't give examples here because I know for a fact Carolina Small, Small Business is doing portions of Virginia here as well. Portions of Virginia, North Carolina, and portions of South Carolina. Okay, North Carolina Recovery. I think Portia Virginia is, 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 I think now, I, I may be saying it wrong, but I know that there's various programs um, that we have um, in, that covers parts of Virginia, okay? Now, your state offices, your capital state offices, you should be contacting, it would rather be your government's offices, your economic development offices, because I'm gonna be honest with you, there's a lot of programs that I'm not even aware of until we get a phone call 
in a sense to say that as we do Zooms here, we do we Zoom with a lot of clients, a lot of business owners and stuff. So our office get calls and say, look, you know, we would like to put a Zoom to tap into your database of business owners to apply for these programs. I'm like, well, I wasn't aware these programs existed. Yeah, we just started. I mean, literally, programs are coming out today and the money gone next week. So by the time we've literally had Zoom, by the time we get the Zoom together, the money's already depleted. Because only, and I'm not saying, you know, by intentions, you know, this is a, a monster that's going on now. And the, the, the need is so bad, the demand for funding is so, so, so great that by the time we time get around to putting people together, the ones who knew about it, not saying anything, the fans not saying at all, is gone. So I would say, please contact your state offices, your governor's offices, see what programs they have. You know, the, this because the reason I say contact, identify your state CDIF, CDIF offices, because most of the money is being disseminated through community development organizations. Okay, okay. most of the monies are being developed and being uh, being administered through community development organizations okay so any community development organization they got all the money <laughs> they help them get get uh, get all the money out okay um there's okay. now i'm also tell you on any any of you who bank with uh wells fargo or you know um um BBT, the nation um, bank of america whatever contact your, your your banks because banks now are having are uh, getting grants to help their business owners and individuals, but I'm be honest with you, business, that's why I say you, your structures are important right now. It's going to be viable because a lot of money, not saying it's not for individuals, but a lot of this money is coming out to sustain, rebuild businesses, small businesses. That's where the bulk of the money is headed. That's where the bulk of the money is going. So I advise everyone on this call, please, Look at structuring your entities. Not saying it for your business. We structure it across the United States. We would love to have your business. We would love to help you with that. And we're going to, Kenneth's going to shoot all the information out to you on that. But what I'm saying, there is money coming. There's money already out here. And contact your bank and ask what community programs they have. BBT had a $20 million, million dollar program. West Fargo had a community program. Bank of America got a community program. A lot of these institutions and a lot of your community banks have community programs because even though they're utilizing CIS, I think with the, I don't want to use, use the word debacle, but when they had first tried to initiate with a lot of the, the, the national brand banks, the West Fargo and all that, like them and stuff, um, they had problems. I, I'm just, I can't say they had problems the same for what we understand. We're really what we talk to banks about. But a lot of them are not the, the, the new money or, or, or money that's proposed to come out is going to be coming out through your community banks. So please now, I'm not saying go over the bank out of the bank. I, I would because we do, but I'm saying talk to community banks. They have money too. A lot of community banks because they're seeing the best way to get the money into the communities is through the CDIFs and the community banks. Okay? Okay. All awesome. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. Please, any, any questions? Any questions? Hello. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you. This is the time that I've uh, listened to it. I'm uh, affiliated with the Minority and Veteran Farmers of the Piedmont here in Colbert, yes. Virginia. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And I wanted to, uh, one of my questions was we received uh, grant money from several. Uh, entities this year uh, to help feed the community to food bank and we supplied 6,000 pounds of food to uh, four food banks in our area mm -hmm. and the money that we received from the different entities for that um, how do we report that how do we how do we handle that uh, money that we received um, for uh, growing the food and taking it to the food banks? Well, here's the thing. Now, uh, first of all, 
Are you following C3? Uh, yes, we are. Now, if you are following C3, you pretty much going to, I'm sure you're going to file your 990. Anything under $50,000, the 250000 you can do a 990 EZ. But if you are filing C3 and you're not over a certain amount, only thing you got to do is keep the financial records, okay? All right? And you'll be reporting that probably through your, your nonprofit, okay? Because now the, the nonprofit received the money, correct? Correct. The entity, okay. the organization, yeah. Yeah, if the audience ain't receive the money, they just you you make sure you keep good books. We work with a lot of nonprofits, okay? And you just gotta keep the records of the money that came through because if you have not received a certain amount over the year, you still don't have to do but a 990 postcard. Now, if you receive over a certain amount of annual revenue for your nonprofit, then you have to do a full 990. See, a lot of people don't understand. If your poor nonprofit don't receive up to a certain amount, they keep raising it every year. You don't have to fill anything out with a 990 postcard. So, again, accurate accountability and records are crucial, okay? The 99 is all about 99. We work with, we have all these financial statements. That book I just showed you, we we provide all this to our, our nonprofit and our business owners and stuff, okay? Our financial statements, because that is a contributing factor now on monies they may receive in the future. They do look at your financial accountability of it, sir. But you don't have to file a form if you don't if you're not required to, okay? That's all gonna be under under um the, the filing three. Okay. Before I, I, I add I but before I, I ask Okay, go ahead. Ahead. No, I was gonna say before I, I before I ask it, I, I'm just finished. Well, I would like everyone before I forget, as we're talking here, please shoot us your uh name, business uh, name, and your email address. We want to include you on our annual um uh, on our monthly report, our monthly um, notifications and stuff, we're going to be emailing people out, tax tips, things they need to know, different things with all the new changes coming up. So please, as we as we continue, we want everybody, so Candace and Cecilia who are here, uh, we can start building our database and making sure you get all the information. So please send us your, um, through the chats or whatever, your email, phone number, name, phone numbers, email addresses, and company names, okay? But please go ahead. You said your next board meeting? At our next board meeting, because I'm well, one of the executive board members, I'm going to recommend, and I think every uh, few of our board members have ac actually also attended the other workshop that you did mm -hmm. at the Carver Center out there mm -hmm. for us, our group and people in the community, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I would very much like to have you um, handle our uh, financial and give us advice. So uh, I'm going to be reaching out to you individually and mm -hmm. also uh hope when the board approves for you to uh advise us and to mm -hmm. set up whatever we need uh because uh i don't know anything about this at all i'm totally lost and we need someone of your expertise to help us well I, let me pick, we'll be honored to, to be uh, to serve as, as, as your, your firm we, 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 we welcome that opportunity um, we work with, with nonprofits in multiple states, okay? And one thing that I would say um, in regards to your nonprofit, we just picked some some, some rooms up in Mississippi. We have our, our offices, so everybody know we have offices here in in uh, Antonio, in, in North Carolina, UNC Pembroke, North Carolina. We have offices in uh, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Mississippi, South Carolina. And we're looking over there as well. We're looking at open offices in Toluca, uh, Louisiana. But it will be, it'll be our pleasure to work with you and your organization as we work with organizations because right now, the need is such great and such great demand, organizations are going to be, be getting a lot of funding. And we tell people, the more accountability and transparency that you have, you will have more opportunities to get this funding to support the communities. So it will be, it'll be our pleasure, our honor, um, to um, to be able to talk with you in regards to that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So, can I get your name, sir? Yes, my name is Thunder Lane. And there again, I'm okay. with the Minority and Veteran Farmers of the Piedmont here in Colbert, yeah. Virginia. Okay. All right. Well, we, we look forward. Please send us your information. We'll be different. Um, our business development, as I said, we'll be reaching out, uh, contacting. We we'll definitely look forward to talking to you today. We we'll look forward to talking to you today. Okay. 
Thank you. Why we want to help you? Okay, we give you you can send us your information. I think they they got the laptop running over here, receiving all the information. Um, so um, we look forward to it. Okay, look forward to it. Okay. okay. Any questions? Uh, please. I, I, again, I, I don't want people to feel that if they ask a question, is a dumb question. Please ask questions. We, we tell people all the time. If you didn't understand something I said, please, please, I beg you, let me explain it. Let me let me explain it. Of course, we we work on opportunities to speak with everyone individually. Uh, we work on opportunity to um, have the opportunity to discuss with you individually. But if there's any questions here today that I can explain, and it may be beneficial to someone else, because someone else may have the same question. Um, so please. In, in I have a question. I have mm -hmm. a question. Um, so I'm in the I'm in Northern Virginia, and I'm in the process of trying to decide whether or not to do an S corp or a nonprofit. My goal is to start a. Um, an urban farm or community garden, and I'd like to put the, to lease the land from um, a, like a municipal park, like Parks and Rec, and make it to where it's easily accessible for people within the community. Certain, we have pockets in Northern Virginia, um, specifically in Prince William County, where we have a lot of lower income families. And then we have, you know, two streets over, we have multi-million dollar homes. So there's a lot of food disparity um, it, where we live. And so my goal is to do that, but I'm trying to figure out if starting a nonprofit or an S Corp, because I, what I'm finding is a lot of grants and things like that from the USDA, if I'm not a nonprofit because I'm not, um, you know, a government agency or whatever, um, I don't qualify for a lot of those. And my objective is to try to have as as little, I guess, like you were talking about personal liability because I want it to work. And I have a lot of people that are interested, you know, in working with the board and things like that. Um, and also trying to work in agritourism, which is, you know, kind of starting to roll in Virginia right now. Um, but I'm at that stage where I want to start it out right, and I don't want to. And I know starting a nonprofit can take time um, to to get approved for that. So when I'm starting out this this process, in your opinion and your experience, would it make more financial sense for me to knowing what I want to do, and it's not going to be a money machine; it's going to be a community project. Does it make more sense in your experience to? Um, how do how basically how do I start my entity? How do I start <laughs> at that point? Okay, can you want to ask real real quickly, what will your nonprofit be doing? What will your nonprofit be doing? So it would be it would be an urban farm, but it would be mostly focused on um, agricultural education, working with surrounding schools. It okay. would also be donations to food pantries, but also sales. So like a place where. Um, uh, we, you know, we could have a farm stand. One thing that I, that is really, really important to me and why I started doing this is because I want to give kids an opportunity to have employment, um, oh, absolutely. working experience, absolutely. Uh, and things like that in high school. You know? and, 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 and here's my advice to you. Okay. If you have a nonprofit, you could do all this under nonprofit. You say you want to teach children, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm saying it correct, please correct me, about urban urban farm, urban garden, giving them employment, correct? Correct, correct. But what I would do, this is what I would do. I would start that nonprofit, but I also have me a for-profit. Let me explain to you why, okay? If you have all these kids that you want to teach about urban garden, urban, urban farming, if you own the land or own the farm, you're going to lease the land, lease the farm, then do start that for-profit because that's where you're going to be doing all the, the, the cultivating, the gardening at. You start the, the 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 nonprofit to raise the revenue to that your nonprofit is going to implement this program. How to teach children or kids about urban farming? But if they come into the classroom in your nonprofit, that you get this money for your nonprofit, then you're going to co collaborate with the for profit. You're going to go and say, "Look, I need a, I need." An acre of land, using examples, I need an acre of land. Your for profit is gonna, your non your for profit is gonna own the land and the farm. 
Because if the nonprofit owns all the asset, you can get voted off. That becomes assets of that nonprofit. And you can get voted off. So, but if you own, if you put the land and everything in it, if you vote off, it's now become assets of, of the nonprofit. But the best way to do it, like I said, is I would form a nonprofit, but the nonprofit will be able for be to raise the funds needed to implement your programs. Design the programs within the nonprofit. Then go to your for profit and say, look, I have this three week program to teach every child how to grow cucumbers. If you come to business owners like ourselves and individuals like everyone here and say, would you sponsor a child? Or would you go apply for USDA programs or government programs, all the programs through a nonprofit. You go to Walmart, you go to Bank of America, you go to BBT, you go to all the corporations. Yes, this is a nonprofit. This is where we are raising money to do the programs. But your for-profit is going to say, I'm going to charge you $125 per child to teach them how to grow tomatoes. That's how you do it. So okay. you're saying that that's how my for-profit would make money also, right? So it would go from, it would go, it would basically trickle from the grants from the nonprofit so that it could sustain the for-profit. Yes, but not to sustain the for-profit. The nonprofit is to sustain the nonprofit. But what I'm sure. saying is, because you, I said earlier, you could do everything under this nonprofit. You could. But what most people make mistakes is try and do everything under nonprofit, but you got a farmer sitting over here who know how to grow tomatoes. He know how to fertilize. He know how to run equipment. Then most nonprofits don't. But if you try to bring everything to the nonprofit, and I think the easy and most sufficient way is, is the fact that, as I said, I just want to make sure it's said correctly. It's not for the money to sustain the for profit. It's for the money to sustain and make the responsibilities of the nonprofit by utilizing the for-profit to meet the goals and its objectives. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that. In terms of yeah. like leasing the land and things like that, um, are there any, so I know of um, Fauquier Education Farm, which is run mm -hmm. by Jim Hankins mm -hmm. Morrison, and they're basically a nonprofit and they lease the land from the county and it's some ridiculous, mm -hmm. I think it's like a dollar. Uh, because of the nonprofit. Because of the nonprofit. Um, you know, so in terms of um, finding something like that, in your experience, do you think it's reasonable when I'm, because I'm, I'm just now in the process of working with um, municipalities. Do you think that it's reasonable to say, um, hey, because I'm a nonprofit, I don't want to, I want to pay a dollar a year, right? I mean, I, I don't want to, my problem is, is that, you know, when you're meeting somebody new, I don't want to steamroll them and them kind of be like, really? A do you know what I mean? Because they need money too. Um, well, well, no, no, you, you, you know, you're not steamrolling. These are opportunities that they have because we got a client, we had a client down in North Carolina, they gave her two bills for a dollar a year. Oh, and, wow. okay. and so the purpose, again, now, here's the purpose of that nonprofit, is because it will qualify for programs. So here's again now, if you go to the municipality and you got to get a building for a dollar a year, that's a nonprofit, that's a lease, okay? So absolutely, I, I, I will it. We have programs here. I, I actually was part of a program in Newport News, Virginia. Okay, well, if I say it right, up in Newport News, Virginia, where the not where the, where the, the, the city council gave this group I was working at the time, they gave them the building at no charge, and I think it was going to be at a, a, a dollar a year for the first three years at no charge. Then it, thereafter, like a dollar or something like that. So absolutely, that happens all the time. Because you remember now, the cities and municipalities and stuff, they have all this building, they have these buildings and stuff. So the purpose of it is to support the community through nonprofit organizations. Yeah, one of the things that we've seen lately in our area, which is what gave me the idea to reach out to, you mm -hmm. know, different municipalities and parks and rec is because um, land, especially in Northern Virginia, is just so expensive. I mean, even, mm -hmm. you know, 100 miles outside of D.C., it could be, you know, $30,000 an acre, you know, so it's very expensive here. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciate that advice. That's something I'll definitely look into. I'm going to add something. Many cities and municipalities donate and give these buildings to nonprofits. They need to do that. Some of them give you a dollar. And as I'm recalling, because once they show, and again, remember now, what people look at now is probably all you need to object is, what, is doing what you say you're going to do. So we're going to keep giving you money. It doesn't matter if you go out and get the for profit to teach the children, using an example, to teach the kids growing tomatoes. The fact of the matter is, did you meet your judges on educating these kids on how to grow a tomato? Right. How to right. become urban farmers. That's why I say I don't want you to say it's sustain a for profit, it's sustain a non profit, but your collaboration with the not with the for profit making your program successful. Right. Did so I just saw some, 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 go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I appreciate it. I know I have a lot of questions. I don't want to take up all the time. Um, but, I got time. Y'all got time. No, no, <laughs> how long we got here? But please, I got, we, you got time. Please ask questions. If they don't mind, please ask questions because I'm on y'all time. I guess, I guess what I mean when I say sustain the, the for profit is that, you know, I'm going to have two separate entities, right? I'm going to have, you know, I'm filing two different types of of taxes every year. Um, I'm, it's going to be double the bookkeeping, um, you know, and things like that, which is totally fine. What is the, from your experience, your expertise, having that, you said earlier that the, the for-profit is kind of where it works with the nonprofit. What should I really be using that for-profit for to my advantage? If I'm a nonprofit mostly operating, like what is, you know, because I'm thinking like I want to make everything as efficient and successful as possible because Absolutely. I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to put, you know, all this time. I've been planning this for over a decade. I don't want to mm -hmm. put, you know, two years worth of my life, blood, sweat and tears. And then it goes up in flames after the first year because I'm not managing most efficiently. So what is that? What can I do to get the most out of that for profit in? But what I'm saying for the most out of our properties is to make your blood, sweat, and tears, the, two, the years that you've been designing this program, make it successful. Well, here's what I mean. If you, and I'm using all this as an you say, I want to teach children how to grow, a be, how to work in urban gardens, okay? That's your lifeblood. That's what you want to do, correct? Right, right. That's but, best way, yeah. that's, but the best way to be successful at it is to go get somebody who know how to grow urban gardens. Go get a farmer who can tell you what no tails means, who can tell you how to run those equipment, who can tell you how deep to put that, 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 that seed. Because what happens is, not saying that the nonprofit can do it, you may get people to work with any nonprofit, who, who knows that? But a lot of times, most nonprofits, the nonprofit collaborate with for-profits to implement their program to make sure that that child is meeting the goals in which they set or which they, when they wrote that grant and that grant funding said was, here's what we're going to do. And see, more grants allow you to go out and subcontract. I mean, just yesterday, we signed with some interviews. We do a lot of training for our, um, our, non uh, for our, our nonprofits. When they do education community development training programs, we do want to conduct the programs because we educate the knowledge they need. So what I'm saying is that I'm not going to say, and I'm not saying you say anything wrong. I just don't want you to think meaning that you're going to take nonprofit to build up a for profit. You're going to take the nonprofit to build a for profit, but you're going to utilize the expertise. The board going to get together and say, you know what? I'm going to get uh, ABC Farms. ABC Farm say they're going to lease us a plot of land. ABC Farm say that we're going to have the opportunity on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays to come over and they're going to take our and, and conduct our classes that we ask them to conduct. The board votes, the board agrees. ABC Farm says we're going to charge you 125 per class. The board, the board votes, the board agrees, bam. ABC Farm is building that making your nonprofit successful. Got it. Okay. That makes so sense. So ABC and also Yeah, ABC Farm say we're gonna mm -hmm. and Damn, also Mr. along that line through the Virginia State University uh small farm program, we have a staff person up in your area 
And what you can do, you can give me a call at 804-892-4518 and I can put you in touch with that person. Sorry, give me that number one more time. I'm gonna put it in my phone, 804? Yes, 892-4518. And it's the same number that's on the, uh, you got it when you rush the, for this program, you just call me and I'll give you a contact person for that area. That would be great, Mr. He, thank you. And he can help you with that. Yeah. And I, 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 I want to let y'all know, we're here in North Carolina, we have offices in a different state. We more than happy and willing to serve you, help you get your nonprofits for profit. We do all that for you. We have quite a bit of clients in Virginia area, throughout the state of Virginia. We want to be a firm. If it's all profit, we want to be a firm. We work with people throughout now. So any help and assistance that y'all need, corporate structure, corporate development, nonprofit. You had mentioned that nonprofit. Nonprofit now, now you don't you don't have to apply for nonprofits the old way. Now it's a new way. You can get nonprofits in two weeks now. Now that was before COVID now, okay? But what I'm trying to say to you for now is with nonprofits, when you apply for nonprofit, you can go now through the EZ forms, okay? You don't, you don't apply for nonprofit like your traditional use of platform. Now it's an easy form, and we've got nonprofit mostly in two or three weeks, period. Wow. That's really yeah. good to know. Now, I appreciate that, yeah. But let me say this now. COVID has changed a lot because <laughs> a lot of... A lot of apartments are out, but no, you don't have to wait months for nonprofit. No more, no. You can put nonprofit in two weeks. As long as you go to the easy, as long as you qualify to apply for the easy form. Okay? In terms of the nonprofit, too, I was reading because, like I said, I've been studying this for mm -hmm. a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of as it is right now, I don't have a full, like, I have a few people that are interested potentially in being the board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything I should be cautious of in terms of conflict of interest for the people, okay. especially, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hire, I don't want to have someone on my board that, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to get in a situation where I have, you know, where like, oh, I'll give you, you know, a grant or I'll give you $20,000, but for the next five years, you have to put my sign litter my side, you know, you know what I'm saying? Which if I have to, I, that's fine. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. The one thing I'm gonna tell you, and I tell all my nonprofits, do not go out here and get a big board from the beginning. Okay. Our the bylaws, when we structure our nonprofits, we structure our bylaws to say no less than three, no more than seven, no less than three, no more than nine, no less than three. Well, here's what we try. It could be no less than five, no more than, than 15. What we're saying is if you say I got a seven member board. A seven member board nonprofit. You gotta have seven at all time. If you come and get audited, but if you say I got no less than three, but no more than fifteen, I can have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I can grow my board because the biggest thing I tell people all the time: once you start a nonprofit, ain't nothing gonna happen until money starts flowing. You are gonna have meetings, you gonna have everything, and nobody gonna show up. Everybody gonna have nothing to say. But as soon as you get that big one, big grant when VSU gonna give that hundred thousand dollar grant, everybody gonna run in now. Wait a minute, I want this, this, everybody come in. I'm telling everybody, be praying on it. Ain't nobody gonna do that until money shut and the money starts showing up. But keep your beginning at a minimum. Got it. No less than three, you gotta have at least an audit. You can have one, two, no less than three, no more than 15, no less than five, more, no more than 17. Cause you always say three, four, five, six, seven. But I say it to you very clearly. If you have a genuine concern in building community, add people who share your vision. Okay? Don't go out and get a big board in the Get you a small board. Let us or someone design your, your, your bylaws that say no less than three, no more than 15, no less than three, more than seven. Because at any time, you can vote in it. In our ballot, it says at any, at any time you can admit, you can vote to amend. You can change it at any time. The three board members say, we want to span our board to 15. Vote, change it. We want to decrease it. Vote, change it. Got so it. keep it small, keep it small, keep it small, and then begin that way. And then yeah. you grow your board. So yeah, we need more to really happen help you with it. Can you feel my, can I get your name? My name is Megan Barony. 
Okay. All right. And, um, Sorry, yeah, I didn't brush my hair today. Otherwise, I'd turn on my camera. I no, that's that. fine. Please, please. We, 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 don't, we do like ask if people don't mind giving us their phone numbers or emails. But for privacy, we ask that you please send it to us because we'll definitely be reaching back out to you today. If you don't mind, Ms. Ms. Barron, if you want to give it to us now or you can send it through chat, please give us your phone number and email and we'll be reaching back out to you. Absolutely. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you again. Please, I really appreciate please, your please. help. So when I say to everybody, please, people who are not comfortable giving their emails and phone numbers out, please, please put it in our chat so we can have it. Because we want to be include you on our database because we want you to have the information. And the reason I'm saying this now, because this thing is going to change because I think it's Section 139, because of COVID, it's going to be tons of stuff out here next year if you have a lot of expenses and stuff you're incurring business and personally, because of COVID, is they're going to be allowing you to utilize tax deductions next year. It's going to be a lot, a lot, and lots of tax breaks coming out now. They're changing now. But right now, from what we're getting, it's going to be a ton of tax breaks coming out now. And so we want to keep our clients, our conference meetings, even if we're not your clients, we will still want to give you the information. We want you to have the information. Personally, agriculturally, we want you to have the information, especially from the agricultural perspective, okay? We want to work with you, okay? Any Tana? more questions? Yes, I have mm -hmm. one quick question. Sure. So I already filed with the state as a sole um, person. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to become a corporation? Do I have to go back to the state and- No, no, when you say you file as a sole proprietorship, that means you file a articles of organization or articles incorporation. What do you say? Now you said you've already filed with the state as a sole proprietor, correct? Yes. Now listen, you cannot file with the state as a sole proprietor. So the question I ask you: Did you go to the state and did you file an articles of incorporation or organization with the state? I don't know if I know what that means. Did you? Do you have an LLC? Do you no, have I don't an have, I don't have an LLC. I want to have one. Okay. Then remember now, you can't file the state unless you got a withholding number saying you're a sole proprietorship. Here's what I mean. The only thing that you file with the state is the articles of organization, LLC, articles of corporate INC. You file with the IRS, tell them what you want to be when you get that EIN number. Then you yeah, tell I the have, state. I have an EIN number. So your EIA number is a is tax as a sole proprietorship, correct? Yeah. Now the only way that you can change that, we need to create now an entity in the state, because you can't say that you have an LLC. Correction, you can't say you have an LLC in the state of Virginia, right? I'm in North Carolina. Oh, oh North Carolina. Okay, great. You in North Carolina, either either state. If you got an LLC, if you got an EIA number. If you don't have an LLC, now you can go apply for LLC, but it, the name got to match that EIN number. So do I go back to the state of North Carolina? It, it, it sounds like you have never been to the state of North Carolina. You just need to go and form an entity in the state. Okay. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is it sounds like you've never been there yet. Again, now, when you get an EIN number, you're talking to the federal, the IRS. When you get a organization, you're talking to the state, okay? And I want to say this real briefly. A lot of people don't understand. When you have payroll, whether it be non-agriculture, agriculture, when you report your forms at the end of the year, you are not talking to IRS. You're talking to Social Security. A lot of people think when you do payroll and you file your payroll reports, that's not going to IRS. That's going to Social Security. Social Security returns the report to IRS. I want people to know that. A lot of people think that Every time I do payroll, I'm going to IRS. No, you're not. It's going, your reports are going to Social Security. Okay? But yes, ma'am. What you can do, we, can, we will contact you. You can give us a call. Uh, if you want to share your number, please send it to the chat. You can give it to us now. We'll call you and guide you through that, the information what you need to do. Okay? All right. We have just about reached our time limit, but I certainly want to thank Mr. Tenney. Thank you for, mm -hmm. for his presentation. We've been working with him for many years now. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> always great. And we all, really... I don't know where we would be if it wasn't for him. We but thank you. I appreciate 
mm-hmm. all your work. Mm-hmm. And I thank all of you that joined in today. And as he said before, get in touch with him, get in touch with, mm-hmm. with me, and we'll always be glad to help you. And Please. anytime you have any suggestions or any needs for programs, you give me a call and we, we can work those out. And remember yes. one thing today, farming is a business. The only failures that I have seen in my 40 some years of working is because they didn't act like the country folks, or they didn't act <laughs> business like. You have to handle yes. your business. Yes. Production is easy and that's what everybody starts with, but you mm-hmm. need to start with your business. It's a business thing. We call it the average business way. We we call it the average business way. (laughs) Exactly. And I thank you all for for being a part of this today. Thank you for the opportunity from here. Thank you for our staff for the opportunity, okay? All right. And everybody else have a good day and stay safe. All right. Thank you.